Hey guys, how are you? Hello, hello, hello. All right, this this is going to be a really powerful, helpful, needed lesson that I believe is going to be here as long as YouTube exists. I believe that this lesson is going to be used for years to help people who are not only married, but people who are unmarried. Uh, I believe that this lesson is going to help those of you who are in crisis. Um, it's something that the Lord laid on my heart to put up. So whenever couples find themselves, you know, going through it or what have you, when the enemy tries to come in and he begins to wage war against marriages and stuff like that. Um, so, the, you know, typically during times like that, we are looking for help. And uh, sometimes, you know, some couples can't afford marriage counseling. Um, a lot of times people don't know what to do. And God said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And I want you to understand that marriage is per perish for lack of, lack of knowledge. Everything where there is no knowledge, there it, it has the potential to fail. And so this is the, uh, the goal is that I come out here and I teach. I put this revelation out here and I pray that your eyes and your ears are open to receive this revelation, that your heart and your ears are open to receive this revelation. Hello, y'all. Hello. Do me a favor as you're coming in. Let me know that you're here. Let me know that you're here. Let me know where you're coming, you calling in from. Are you tuning in from what city, state, what country? Where are you tuning in from? Listen, I actually went live earlier. The Lord laid on my heart earlier to go live on a topic. You'd be amazed at how much I see this on social media, where you see couples breaking up, couples breaking up, couple, couples breaking up, or what have you. And um, the Lord laid on my heart earlier, and I went live on actually uh, TikTok, or what have you. Um, but I had no notes when I wrote, went live on TikTok. I just went straight from the heart. Um, but... After I finished, I realized I gave them some good some good information, right? But I'm like, no, I want to come back and I want to give uh, some practical tips. You know, this is something that God laid on my heart. I was going to lead it for, but I want to come back and give some practical tips so that people know what to do, um, so that people can get the revelation. And again, I can't put emphasis on this enough. This is not just for single people. I mean, not just for married people. If you plan on getting married, you want to put this in your arsenal. You want to save this video. You want to take notes. You want to put this, take this word and you want to, you know, apply it to your life. Um, you want to put this in your arsenal. That way you can prepare yourself. I was thinking um, I didn't have I didn't have a chance to write out as many notes as I want to. I mean, I got quite a few notes, but I wanted to do a few more notes and I may come back and do a separate video for that. Maybe sometime this week or next week. But I do want to talk to um, even though this particular lesson is for marriage minded people, married people and marriage minded people. I do want to come out and talk to you, those of you who are unmarried, and tell you how to avoid getting divorced. See, a lot of times we don't think about how to avoid getting a divorce before we get married. We just think I'm in love with you. You're in love with me. So we're going to stay together. We underestimate what warfare looks like. We underestimate how um, diligent the enemy can be, how consistent, how uh, abrasive, how how strong uh, the enemy can be. We, we underestimate that. God tells us before you build a thing count the cost. And if you even uh, brother Jay or sister Jay, I'm not sure. Um, even if you're at the point of divorce, this is, this will still help you. This will still help you. Where are the people at? I was expecting there'd be more people in here by now. Do me a favor. Be sure to like, be sure to share, be sure to like, be sure to share, be sure to like, and be sure to share. I was expecting, I went live on YouTube and I was telling people on YouTube, TikTok, I was letting everybody know over there, about 400 people came in. I was letting everybody know over there. Hey, listen, I'm about to go live on YouTube or what have you. So I guess some people are still searching it out, but I do need you guys help. Do me a favor. Be sure to like, be sure to share. Um, if you know somebody that is struggling in their marriage, if you know somebody that is um, about to go through a divorce, or even if you know somebody who wants to get married, maybe they're marrying somebody and they're kind of unrealistic about what things can happen, or just somebody getting married, period. Even if they got a good marriage um, or a good relationship with their partner, this is a good video to share with them, to help them uh, to, so that they can make sure. OK, thank you, Brother Jay. God bless you um, to help them in their walk, to help them in their journey. So we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm not going to wait for everybody to get up in here. I think some of my uh, TikTok family decided to go fry some chicken or something. They said, we're going we gonna to find something else to do. And then we're going to come up in there. We're going to get us some popcorn. We're going to get us some popcorn. So we're going to start off here. And this is something I pulled up from Google, but it's AI on Google. Oh, what have you? So I don't know how to give credit to it. So anywho, AI on Google. The Greek word for divorce is apolu, and that's spelled A-P-O-L-O-U. 
which is made up of the word of the Greek preposition apo, meaning away from, and the verb luo, meaning to loose. The Greek word for divorce is apolu, which is made up of the Greek preposition apo, meaning away from, and the verb luo, which meaning to loose. Now I'm picking up my phone because I had pulled up another article and I was like, you know what? I'm not writing all that down. I'm going to come and I'm going to read it to y'all. I'm going to read a piece of this to you guys so you can get um, more information. So this topic, this particular one is race. What is this? EgraceBibleChurch.org divorce. EgraceBibleChurch.org. And the topic is divert, divorce and desert, desertion. Let me get it together. Divorce and desertion. And it talks about that word we just got to talking about, apolu. The Greek word apolu is composed of the Greek preposition apo, which means away from, and the verb luo, which means to loose. Hence, the meaning is loose away from yourself and refers to the legal dis dissolution of a marriage. Apolu is used in Matthew 119, Matthew 532, Matthew 193, Matthew 197, Matthew 197. Matthew 19, 9, Mark 10, 2, Mark 10, 4, Mark 10, 11 through 12, and Luke 16, 18. And it was something else. Oh, this is what I wanted to read. The Greek word apple, and this is apostation. This was really interesting. The Greek word apple means away from, and station is a standing or a tearing. Apostation means a tearing away from, a stand, a tearing away from, or a standing away from. It refers to a defection or a standing off in the marriage relationship where a secession of the love relationship has occurred, whether based on personal or impersonal love. The situation usually leads to divorce. Apostation was used for a bill, was used for a bill or a writing of divorcement. This is seen in Matthew 531, Matthew 197, and Mark 10:4. And we're not going to read those scriptures. You can just write them down. Apostation is also the word from which we get the word apostasy. I thought that was really interesting. What is apostasy? It is the same thing, by the way, by way of analogy that happens in a marriage. First of all, there is rejection by one or both parties. This is what happens when a believer becomes apostate. Apostate. He rejects the word of God and becomes indifferent and hostile towards it. First, there is rejection, and then there is separation. There is a separation before divorce, whether formal or in, uh, informal. This is when people who become rever reverenistic separate themselves from doctrine and doctrinal teaching. We're going to stop right there. Again, this is from egracebible.org, and the topic is divorce and desertion, and is written by Reverend Thomas Tyree. Pastor Grace Bible Church of Costa Mesa, California. Always want to make sure we are giving credit. All right, welcome aboard. Now, I know some people won't come in here because in their mind, they think I'm not married, so I don't need a lesson like that. And I think that's the dumbest type of thinking uh, to have. Now, I don't want to necessarily say, I'm not saying that anybody that thinks that way is dumb. I'm saying it's not a, a wise way to think because whenever you're using wisdom, you prepare beforehand, right? Uh, whenever you're using wisdom, you sit back and you say, I don't want to say in my heart that that can never happen to me because I've been humble before. I've had things that happen to me that I never thought would happen to me. I've had I've been through stuff that I never thought I'd go through before. And so because of that, let me prepare myself so that I don't ever step by myself staring down the throat of the word divorce. Uh, let me prepare myself. Now, I can be honest and tell you guys, and you, if you don't know my story, I've been married two times. I was married two times. I got married the first time when I was. Um, I met that guy when I was maybe 20 years old. I think I met him when I was 20 years old, maybe 21 and um, maybe 22. I'm not sure. That was 2020. I was two, the year 2000. I was born. So yeah, I, was, I met him when I was 22. I met him when I was 22. I was freshly saved. That means that all of my ways and my habits were still worldly. Everything about me, my taste was still for the world and all that. So it goes without saying I chose an unsaved man. Uh, what have you? I wasn't old enough to be married. So I got married then. Um, both of our curses came into play, right? I don't just put uh, blame on him. I put blame on myself. I can sit back and say he dealt the fatal blows, but realistically speaking, a house divided cannot stand. See, one thing I want to make sure that you, one thing you're going to find with the teachings that I give 
is that I'm not putting weight or pressure or blame on a person. I'm not going to sit back and say, oh, he did this and he did that. Realistically speaking, the Bible warns. The Bible says a house divided cannot and will not stand. Right. And so we completely ignored it and we focus on our good. We focus on our good works and we say, well, I was good to this person. Well, realistically speaking, we always reap what we sow. We always reap what we sow. You say, what does that mean? Whatever you put in the ground, you're going to reap it. So if you reject God, your spouse will probably reject you. If you commit idolatry against God, meaning you put yourself, your feelings, your plans first, you put your spouse first, you put your children first. Nine times out of 10, your spouse will commit adultery against you. And so a lot of times we get stuck in what that person did. So much so that we don't go to the root of the issue. And how many of you know, if you don't root it out, it grows back. This is why first time marriages, 50% of first time marriages end in divorce. 60% of second time marriages end in divorce. And 70% of third time marriages end in divorce. And, and that has everything to do with the fact that we are cutting the grass where you know we see weeds out in the yard and we're cutting the grass so it looks good for everybody else but we're not taking the time out to get under there and get pull those those weeds out we're not taking the time out so we just keep on trying to make it look good rather than sitting back and saying okay this is an issue that's going to impact my marriage sometimes we can see a little bit of a weed growing off in the corner and we don't think too much about it we say in our hearts you know what that's not going to impact too much or what have you it doesn't affect my yard too much but that, that little bitty weed has the potential to grow up really big and then it's going to release seeds and the wind's going to blow those seeds and some of them are going to go into the neighbor's yards, they're going to go into other people's yards, but some of them are going to stay in your yard. And the next thing you know, that little bitty um, weed plant that you saw off in the corner, now you see little things coming up and popping up throughout your yard. And then I turned around, I got married the second time and... I hadn't learned my lesson. One of the evidences that you haven't learned your lesson is that you're still blaming the other person. That is the evidence that you have not learned your lesson is because you you still point one finger at that person. And you know what they say? The rest of your fingers are, are pointing back at you. Well, I won't necessarily say that the rest of them. I can say in my case, it'd be, you know, at least three of them pointing back at me. But what we have a tendency to do is in a marriage, we focus on what the person is doing repeatedly. Um, that caused us to say, hey, I'm withdrawing my respect from you. Then I'm withdrawing my love from you. I'm withdrawing my, my feet from this house. I'm withdrawing myself from you altogether. But, you know, the thing about it is, and I got to say this, and this is going to bless some of you, for those of you who are married, and this is going to bless those of you who are not married, if you store it in your heart. There are some issues that are issues of disrespect, period, point blank. There are some issues that are annoying, but there are some issues that are strongholds. And I wish you understood that there are some issues that are strongholds. And whenever you're coming in contact with a stronghold, please understand that you can't talk a stronghold down. You can't yell a stronghold down. You can't put a person on punishment and make them break the stronghold. Anytime in a marriage you come across a stronghold, that thing has to be dismantled. Uh, this uh, Strongholds are typically, they're just very strong habits, right? These are systems where people, like for example, some people have a, a issue or an issue of, um, they have a stronghold of, let's say, just getting rude, just being real nasty, real, real nasty, real na mean spirited way. That person nine times out of 10 got a demon. Okay. First and foremost, they need deliverance. But two, they, that person is weak. They're, they're weak, right? And their weakness has set the stage for a stronghold. So something, anytime, wherever you're weak, something is stealing your strength. Something is still in your strength. And so what has to happen in order for that marriage to, to, to survive, if you're coming in contact with a stronghold, you don't argue a stronghold down. Whenever you're coming in contact with a stronghold, you want to make sure you're talking to your spouse and say, hey, listen, babe, I need you to get counseling over here. Hey, brother Andre, God bless you. Babe, I need you to get counseling over here. Like you have a really bad habit of becoming distant you got a really bad habit uh what happened i just need my space i just yeah i understand that but sometimes you could be a little bit rude you have this really bad habit i don't know what's going on with you or what have you i need you to get counseling as it relates to that issue and i think one of the biggest problems or mistakes that we make is that a lot of times what we do is we try to get marriage counseling and i'm, I'm going to speak on that a little bit later we try to get marriage counseling instead of understanding that sometimes people just need individual counseling sometimes it's not a problem with the marriage 
Most issues in marriage have nothing to do with you and your spouse's problems together. It has everything to do with that person's problem with God. It has everything to do. You're going to come to understand this as we go along in this, in this lesson. It has everything to do with their issue with God. What you're doing and you just happen to witness it because you're the closest person or you should be the closest person to your spouse other than God. You're the closest person. So you get to see stuff front row and center. And so I tell people this all the time. Uh, before you get married, look at the person's relationship with the Most High God, because how they are to God is how they're going to be to you. If they're not faithful to God, they're not going to be faithful to you. If they don't give God all of their attention, if they they sitting back and they're so distracted by video games and everything else and they don't want to come to church, guess what? At some point, they're going to be distracted, too distracted to give you their attention. Every issue that you see is always an issue first between them and God. If you're dealing with an adulterer, guess what? They're an idolater. The problem is they exalt how they feel. They exalt their flesh. They exalt other people. They exalt what their friends think. They exalt other things above the will and the word of God, which means that they have not stored God or his word within their hearts. They got God in their heads, but not in their hearts. And so consequently, you will get a chance to witness that you have a front row seat to that or what have you. And it can become relatively problematic, but it has everything to do with their relationship or lack thereof with God. So we're going to go ahead and first and foremost, I'm going, to talk, I'm going to talk about five reasons that you can't divorce your spouse. Five reasons that you can't divorce your spouse. When I went live um, earlier on TikTok, I, I said to the, uh, I asked the, uh, the, the people, I was like, hey, um, why would you divorce your spouse? Like, give me reasons that you would divorce your spouse. And, you know, I, a lot of people came up with different reasons and stuff like that. And the majority, 80, 90 percent of them were not legal. Right. It, it's just things that, hey, I, I don't want to be married no more. Um they get on my nerves and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm like, that's not a legal way or that is not an acceptable way to re, to uh, divorce your spouse. And so I'm going to give you five reasons that you can't divorce your spouse. No worries. Some of them are going to be a little bit annoying, but I will explain. All right. I will make sure that you not only have knowledge, but you have understanding. Number one, you cannot divorce your spouse for repeatedly annoying you. You can't revert. You can't divorce your spouse because he or she is getting on your nerves. He just annoyed me. I, oh, girl, he just annoyed me. Whenever you start getting annoyed with a person, nine times out of ten, there were a lot of mad, imaginations as it relates to that person that you did not bother to cast down. There were a lot of imagine, imagination. There were a lot of conversations that you did not have with that person. And so over the, over the course of time, you've internalized that. And so now it becomes this thing where Everything that they do because you start to despise them in your heart because you're hosting unforgiveness toward them in your heart. So you start to despise them. If you ever been married before and you know what it feels like to despise a, a person, to, to, to despise a person that you're married to, one thing you're going to notice is that think little things that they do can annoy you. The way that they chew, right, can annoy you. You'll start noticing imperfections that nobody else can see. Like the, the back of their head, the left side, there's a little bit of a dent there. You'll start noticing that maybe whenever... Um, they're talking. They have a tendency uh, to kind of froth up at the mouth, mouth or what have you. Stuff that most people don't see, you will tend to see it. So you cannot divorce your spouse for repeatedly annoying you. You just got to get stronger. Realistically speaking, you can make a decision to not be annoyed. That's a decision. It's, an, it's a feeling. I can make a decision. My dog, I gave him a, a T-R-E-A-T, right? He's over there chewing it. I can make a decision that the sound is annoying. Or I can make a decision that the sound is not annoying. And if I make the decision that is not annoying, then I got to communicate that to my, I got to communicate that to my heart until it stops being annoying. Did you catch that? I got to communicate that to my heart until it stops being annoying. I tell people this all the time. A lot of the stuff that annoys you, you can actually learn to laugh at. I'm a jokester. I'm a joker, right? For me, a lot of stuff is funny. Uh, what have you? So some of these issues, for example, uh, I serve with a lot of guys. And I, I have a tendency, you know, over the course of my life, I feel like I've been around guys quite a bit. And the thing that I find funny with men is their pride. I really do. I find it funny. I will toy with your pride. Period. Point blank. Any man that's been around me long enough will tell you I will toy with your pride. If it comes to the surface, I will toy with it. I will toy with it. Right. And so whereas somebody else can be annoyed. Oh, you just being puffed up or what have you. No. One thing I've learned, catch, catch this. I really want y'all to hear this. Do me a favor. Like and share. Do me a favor. Like and share. Catch this. If you learn not to let things get on your learn your nerves, you actually learn to work work around it. If you learn to not allow things to get on your nerves, you will actually learn to work around it. 
So that thing that was annoying you at first, and you know, it could be a stronghold, it could be an issue, or it could just be one of your issues. That thing that was, you know, annoying you, let's say he chewed with his mouth open and he chewed like Mr. Ed. You know, you can sit there and make a joke about it. You can sit there and say, why do you chew? Um, I don't know what happened to you. Did you get kicked in the chin or something? Why you chew like that? Why you chew like that? You can sit there and joke about it and, you know, tell them about it. Now, don't embarrass the person. Don't wait till people come around. But you can sit there and say, you chew like a horse. Why do you chew like that? You know, what, what happened to you in your, in your childhood? You can make a joke about it. And then you can sit there and force yourself to, you know, sit at that table until it no longer annoys you. It's a decision. All right. It's a decision. Love you, too. Love you, too. Thank you. Thank you. Number two. You cannot divorce your spouse for repeatedly ignoring you or, for example, playing video games or doing anything that you feel like, you know, that feel like they're neglecting me. They're not spending that much time with me. They're not spending quality time with me. You can't reject them or you can't divorce them from that. Not legally. Now, the things I'm saying, when I say you cannot divorce, I'm saying legally. I'm talking about in God's eyes where God will approve it. You know, I'll need you to understand that God has to approve everything, especially when it comes down to marriage, divorce. God need you need God's stamp of approval. If God's stamp of approval is not on it, Satan's stamp of approval, approval is going to be on it. You cannot divorce your spouse for repeatedly ignoring you. They keep playing video games. That's not a that is not a cause for divorce. Realistically speaking, in many cases, that's a stronghold. In many cases, that's a cause for you to say, well, let me look deeper underneath the surface to find out why this person uh, feels like they, you know, when they come home, they want to circle, they want to, um, they want to commit their entire life. To playing video games and that's a therapy issue not a marriage counseling issue that's a therapy issue that's something that you will say hey babe i want you to go to counseling because all of the time that you're putting into this video game or you're putting into this you, we could have built built some businesses we could have did a lot of things uh, so that we could build up our money or what have you. you have an addiction and i liken this into a gambling addiction i liken this into a drug addiction or what have you but the only thing is no, what's being impacted is our money in our household. I'm feeling rejected. I'm feeling neglected. And no, I'm not asking you to go play the video game uh, when I go to sleep because maybe I want you there to cuddle me, realistically speaking. And so that's something that you want to talk out. That's something that you want to say, hey, let's get some counseling about. And if the person refuses to get counseling, and then what you have to do is you go to the Father in heaven. And God, a lot of times, will give you the strength and the wisdom to sit with that person, to stay married to that person, and he will start to deal with their hearts, right? Because again, remember that the issue is not between you and the spouse. The issue is between them and God. That's time that he could have been reading his Bible. That's time when he could have been walking around his house and um, putting oil on the walls and what have you, but instead he made the decision to sit there and play uh, video games. Number three, you cannot divorce your spouse because he or she is a narcissist. I gotta let that sit. I gotta let that one sit. Don't run, don't run, don't run, don't leave me now. Don't leave, don't leave. You cannot divorce your spouse because he or she is a narcissist. Now, if they go cheat on you, you can, right? They, If they're putting their hands on you, you can get up out of there. But you cannot divorce them because they are a narcissist. Oil on the walls, I'm talking about annoyance in the wall. You can't divorce them because they're a narcissist. They were a narcissist when you got with them. And nine times out of 10, the only way a narcissist can stay in your life is if you give a sin offering. You idolize them. The narcissist, what legalizes the narcissist is in your life. The narcissist in your life. Maybe I'm speaking too fast today. But what legalizes the narcissist in your life is idolatry. You want to get rid of the narcissist? Get rid of your idol. You want to get rid of the narcissist? Get rid of your idol. It's that simple. Get rid of your idols. Stop worshiping them. Stop putting them on a pedestal. And you got to be willing to lose them jokers. That means if I don't, I'm not worshiping you. I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to put God first. I'm going to Matthew 6, this household. Seek, submit yourself to God. No, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. I'm going to give God back his rightful place. I'm going to get up and go to church, whether or not he puts me on punishment or not. I'm going to go up here. I'm going to pray. I'm going to spend time with God. I'm going to do everything that God wants me to do. The only way a narcissist can be in your life is if you give the sin offering and you repeatedly worship them. That's it. Now, but they're putting their hands, you can get out of their house. Now, the Bible doesn't say if a person is abusing you, physically abusing you, they can divorce you. I think 
we as humans we consider that an extreme so we we will typically say yeah you can do that uh, but I tell people all the time, I say, you know, if a man is hitting on you, a woman is hitting on you, you can bet you by golly while they're cheating. You know, I, I've yet to see, I, I've yet to meet a, a somebody who's physically abusive, who's not also um, cheating. I've yet to meet them. So you will get your legal standing, get up out of there. All right. Sin offering is whenever you give up the sin in order to hold on to the person. For example, I've been absent 10 years now. All right. And so. If a man comes into my, my life or when a man comes into my life, if he's trying to take me toward the bedroom, right, I have to resist. No, you're not doing that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm living for God or what have you because I know that's spiritual. The war is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers, the principalities and the rulers of this dark world and spiritual wickedness in high places. So the enemy doesn't have a legal right to have the enemy. Does not have a legal right to me as long as I stay within the will of God. But if I allowed that man to lead me astray, notice I can use the word lead. If I allowed that man to lead me astray and to body bang or have sex without TikTok so I can be raw. If I allowed that man to come and do what he wanted to do to me, then that spirit in him, the enemy has access or a legal right to not just our relationship, but the enemy then has a legal right to certain aspects of myself. Certain as aspects of myself. And so because I gave I gave my body to the enemy, the enemy will have uh, certain access or certain um, rights to my body. So I can start fighting with disease. I can start fighting with certain things because I gave my body um, outside of the will of God. And so inside the will of God, Tiffany Buckner is not supposed to have sex. Inside the will of God, y'all do me a favor, like and share. Inside the will of God, Tiffany Buckner is not supposed to have sex. Tiffany, whatever my husband's last name, can have sex. So it's illegal for Tiffany Buckner to have sex. You need to do that with your last name to the ladies. What is your first and last name? You need to write it in the comment. Whatever your first name is and your last name, if you're not married, it is illegal for that person to have sex. It is illegal for somebody with a different last name than yours to be on top of you, right? It's, it's illegal. So I'm wearing my dad's last name. The Bible tells us to honor our father and our mother, right? A part of me honoring my father is me not having sex while wearing my daddy's last name. I wish y'all would engage today. Y'all are, come on, engage me. Be up in here. Let me know y'all are here. Let me know y'all are here. Let me know y'all are here. It is illegal. All right. It's illegal for me to go out there and engage with a man as Tiffany Buckner. That's my dad's last name. And so what I have to do is I have to wait until that man honors God enough to put his last name on me. And when he put his last name on me, then right then and there, we can move in honor. And then we can plow it down. We can do all the stuff we want to do, right? But put it in the comment section. Y'all don't be, don't be sleep on me tonight. What is your first and last name? And I want you to write in there, such and such, such and such. And I'm, I'm not talking to the men. I'm talking to the ladies. Can I have sex? Brother Christopher, thank you. God bless you. I'm not going to wait for y'all to put it in there, but I'm just, just, that's just it. Your first and last name, it is illegal for you as long as you're wearing your daddy's last name or your maternal, your paternal grandfather or maternal grandfather. Because some of y'all say, <laughs> I ain't even have, I don't even have, uh, I don't even have uh, my, my, my daddy's last name. So I guess that don't apply to me. No, that's a curse already moving in your family. Do you want to continue in that curse? Because if your daddy's last name is not attached to you, that's a representation of there was some dishonor in your family. There was some sperm that came out that wasn't supposed to come out. Okay? Realistically speaking. Amen. Amen. All right. You cannot divorce your spouse. Number This is number three. You cannot divorce your spouse because he or she is a narcissist. You can only die your way out of that relationship. You got to give up the Ahab spirit. You got to give up putting uh, yourself, your feelings, and other people first. Stop trying to idolize marriage. Stop idolizing the person that you would give God back his place. And James 4, 7 will come into play. Submit yourself to God. Therefore, resist it. Therefore, submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That means not only will the devil flee, but all of the, the devil's minions will flee. Anybody that got the devil in them, they're going to run for their life. They're going to run for their life. All right. Number four, you cannot divorce your spouse because you are no longer in love with him or her or because you're bored. 
Oh, definitely no sodomy. Uh -uh, that's some weird stuff. That's some weird stuff. I've been, I got a lot of questions as to why you want to go there. You cannot, uh, that I'm saying it to the man, that I would have a lot of questions as to why you are interested in somebody's, ain't somebody's tail. Why are you interested in that? Okay. You cannot divorce your spouse because you are no longer in love with him or her or because you're bored with them. You can't do that. If you're no longer in love with the person, that has everything to do with the fact that y'all are not putting the work in. In many cases, it has everything to do with the fact that y'all are not putting the work in with God. And then you're not putting the work in with each other. All right. You're not putting the, the work in. You're not taking the time out. Maybe you got too busy or what have you. And uh, you started taking each other for granted. Familiarity is an issue, not just in leadership, you know, from a leader to a layman. But familiarity is an issue in marriage as well. You can become so familiar with a person that you forget that that person needs to be, you know, taken out or what have you. You forget that that person, you know, needs to be entertained. You forget what it felt like in the beginning while you were courting them, when you were pursuing them. All of that stuff. A lot of times our problem is that we get with somebody and then, you know, we put all the effort and the work and the time and all of this stuff in in the beginning. And then we get with that person. We get familiar and we're just like, OK, now you're just here. And I'm going to say this to the ladies. I'm going to say this to the ladies. You have to make a demand in your marriage. And when I say a demand, I'm not talking about it in a nasty way. I'm not talking about in a private way. The two times I was married, one of the things that I always said, I'm not staying in the house. Take me out. At least once a week. Go up, go up on the couch, baby. Go up on the couch. Go up there. Okay, you can lay down. Lay down. Lay down. I said, take me out. Go up. Good boy. Up. Good boy. Take me out. At least once a week. One thing I find with ladies, sometimes we don't use our voices. Y'all know I talk about that as it relates to sex. Um, women, a lot of times you don't use your voices. I, I can't tell you how many times, you know, I, I, I've, over the years I, I have women say, hey, you know, he doesn't take me anywhere. You know, we don't go out. And I'm like, did you ask him? I told him I wanted to be taken, but he, he never invites me. I said, that's a conversation I consistently have. Right. Don't get complacent. But that's a that's a conversation I consistently have. I'm like, where are we going this week? Who are we going? What restaurant? Take me to a restaurant at least. Because what I'm not going to do is sit up in the house all day long and go to work from, you know, go to work, come home. That that monotonous can create problems in a marriage. Mon being monotone can create problems because you remember what it feels like to be in that nostalgic state. You remember what it feels like to be on cloud nine. You remember what it feels like to be quote unquote in love. You know what I believe about that. But you remember all of that stuff. But when you're no longer getting it at home, the enemy will typically send somebody outside of your marriage to give you that drug. In America and in America and in the Western world, most people are addicted to dopamine, oxytocin and all of those things that are like serotonin and adrenaline. Most people are addicted to that. And so I'm not saying that you got to give people their drug of choice. One thing I always emphasize is that, hey, while you're single, you need to detox from those drugs. You need to detox from that. That way you don't just keep getting in relationships with people and then trying to take them to cloud nine because you're trying to get your drug of, drug of choice. Um, because one thing you're going to come to learn over the course of this event we call life is that marriages that start like that typically don't end well. Marriages that start like that, typically relationships that start like that, typically don't end well. And the reason is because whenever you get somebody high, you got to keep them high and you can't do it. You got to keep them high and you're not going to be able to do it. How are you not going to be able to do it? Because you're not going to constantly be able to perform. You're going to have to deal with life. You're not going to be able to just constantly entertain that person. You got to deal with life. There are going to be times where you don't feel good. There are going to be times when you're, you know, you got a ton of things to do. You may start having kids. Oh, when have you got to cater to those kids? You got to tend to those kids. And so you're not going to be able to always be in this man's uh, face, putting on a lingerie and, and dancing and cooking and trying to be all things to this man. You're not going to be able to do all that. And at the same time, you can mess around and create an expectation. And I think, honestly, in the beginning of relationships, I am um, I do believe that we have a tendency in a honeymoon stage to create an expectation that we're unable to sustain, which means that a lot of times we'll start doing stuff and then we slowly kind of pull away from it. And, you know, when we begin to pull away from those things, it can start making the other spouse 
feel some type of way, even though they may not communicate it, but they start noticing, for example, whereas let's say uh, you just got married and, you know, the first two months of your marriage, every time you went up in the kitchen and you cooked, you always fixed your husband's plate and you always bought it to him. Or maybe y'all ate at the table and you put his plate at the table. But then all of a sudden now you're starting to say, babe, the food is ready. Maybe it was one time, you know, you were in the kitchen, you say, hey, come up in here and you fix this plate, you handed it to him. And then it became this thing where you started kind of doing that from that point on slowly, but surely you drop, you know, you stop holding the plate and you just put it on the counter. You say, hey, fix your plate. And that can start making that person feel some type of way just before we move on. Um, I always tell that story when I was married um, the second time and I was married, we were living in Germany. And I had created a pattern because we were still in a honeymoon phase. Um, but, you know, you always think when you're in a honeymoon phase, you think that you're going to keep that pattern up. But I had created this pattern where I cooked every day while he was at school. No, he was at work. I cooked every day while he was at work. Right. And um, I knew he would get out about six. He would get home about six thirty, seven o'clock. So I would typically start cooking about five, sometimes four thirty, depending on what I was cooking. But I would start cooking and I try to make sure the food was done by the time he got home. And um, whenever he came in the house, if the food was done, it was done or uh, whenever the food got done, I would call him to the dining room and I would put his plate on the table and we would sit at opposite ends of the table because it was a four seater table. He would sit at the head and I would sit at the other part, right at the other end. So I would put his plate on, uh, on the table and I would get juice. And just so you know, Germany, those glasses are so tiny, right? In America, they say we just eat and drink too much, but those glasses are tiny, tiny in Europe. So we would have this little juice or what have you. And I would go down there. And when I put his plate there, I would pour his juice. And then I would go sit down. I pour my juice. I say grace. And then we would get into eating, right? We would probably chat it up and we would eat. Well, one day I was mad at him. I think we got into an argument the night before and I was still upset with him. I was still upset with him. And, um, he comes home the next day. We're still mad. It's, it's still an argument. We're still mad at each other. Don't remember what we were mad about, but I was still mad at him. Nevertheless, I still cooked. I remember I had cooked steak and gravy and rice that day or what have you. And um, it was some type of smother uh, gravy. It was different than like your traditional steak and gravy, but I cooked it. And I remember it took a long time. I, I remember that I did not feel like cooking that day. I remember that I was so tired that I just did not feel like cooking. And yet I peeled myself up and I went ahead. I went up in there and I cooked the meal, even though I was mad at him. Right. Because your feelings should not dictate what you do. You know, if you're doing something consistent, keep it consistent. You never put people on punishment. Punishment is witchcraft. All right. But you never put people on punishment. You communicate. We're going to talk about that. But he came home and um, when he came home. I fixed his plate and I fixed my plate and I poured my juice. And then I had the little juice container and I pushed it down to him with my hand and he stopped and he stared. He said, you're not going to pour my juice. I said, no, you can pour it yourself. And he stared at me for a minute and he says, so you're not going to pour my juice. Tiffany, you're not going to pour my juice. I said, no, you can pour your own juice. He slammed himself up and got up from the table, went up in the other room, slammed the door. I was ticked. I was ticked. I was, I was beyond ticked because I just slaved over a high stove and this dude is refusing to eat simply because I won't pour his juice. But he wasn't totally at fault. I created that habit and then I pulled back. He was at fault for being, you know, really uh, petty and immature about it. But after we reconciled later that day, because he wouldn't eat, he refused to eat. He went up in the kitchen. Uh, I think I slammed the door. He stayed in the room for a little while. After that, he stormed into the kitchen. I remember we got him an apple, went back in the room and started eating the apple. And I remember I'm sitting up in there. I was mad because I didn't put all that effort and time up into there. And he up in the room eating a freaking apple. I thought I did all that cooking or what have you. After that, after we called ourselves reconciled, I don't think we reconciled that day because I remember sitting in the living room in the darkness, feeling sorry for myself. <laughs> but I wouldn't go in the room with him. I was like, I don't want to be in a room with him. I was in the living room praying and crying and mad. Um, but the next day when we uh, talked about it, when we caught ourselves reconciling, I said to him, I will no longer, I will no longer um, pour your juice for you. 
He said, you're not going to pull my juice? I said, no. I said, because the way you reacted yesterday showed me that you have picked up entitlement. I said, you should not have responded that way. Somebody not deciding to pour your juice should not have made you storm away from the table. I'm not going to sit here and play the saint, but I am saying that right now I realize that there are some things that I, I can't do for you or what have you. And I said, pouring your juice is one of them. I said, I'm not going to fix your plate all the time. I said, I'll fix it. But other times I'll tell you, hey, the food up in there, get your plate. You made me a plate, I'm ready. Listen. I, you rebelled at the cooking. I did. I did. But I had I had to take it to the chest. I had to sit back and say, hey, I was wrong. But at the same time, realistically speaking, I don't think I was planning to do that for the rest of my life. I think I was just doing it when we were in the honeymoon phase, right? I don't think it, it's not something you really think about. All right. And so I'm saying that to say, you know, you want to be mindful of the, the patterns that you create. And even uh, whenever you do create a pattern, whatever you realize that the person is starting to get entitled, sometimes you have to pull the plug on that thing. You have to stop and say, hey, listen, uh, we're not doing that no more. Not doing that no more. I sat down. I had a conversation with him. I said, I'm not pouring your juice anymore from this point on. From that point on, I, I sat that juice down there by him. And he was like, you're really not going to pour my juice. I was like, no. You're going to pick up that hand that God gave you, the one that works, and you're going to grab your own juice and you're going to pour it into the glass. See that? You see that? That's what you're going to do. And you're going to drink your juice. That's how that's going to work. If you're no longer in love with your spouse, and um, I will say this, if you're no longer uh, feeling anything nine times out of ten, the reason you're not, I'm going to say this, and it's going to be, this This going to, uh, it really was, this is going to be a little bit of extreme. The reason that you fell out of love with each other is because you fell in love with each other. Does that make sense? I've talked about this whole concept, this American concept, this Western mindset, this Western concept of falling in love. And it's not a real thing. It's being under the influence of words. You either love a person or you don't. There are characteristics. The Bible tells us what love is. And what we've done is we picked up this Hollywood thing where we, what we do is we love bomb each other. I can take, I can take a guy, get him on my phone. Right, it's it's a spell. I can take a guy, get him on my phone, and love bomb the crap out of him, and I swear he, he he will swear he in love. I can sit there, especially if I see his heart is open. He he will swear he in love, and no, no amount he'll be like, I, I want to marry you, I want to have kids with you, this that this that and the other. This is why that stuff don't work, because whenever you call yourself, quote unquote, in love, what ends up happening is you're going to sober up. I've told you guys before what sobers you up. The truth. The Bible said you will know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So what could easily end up happening is I could talk to somebody and I could, or I could go under the influence of a man's words. Right. If I'm not guarding my heart, I could go under, his, under the influence of his words and I could start feeling like I think I'm in love. I think I'm in love. No, I'm under the influence of his words. That's all it is. But. What sobers us up with people is the truth. This is why I always promote to date soberly. To date soberly. When you're talking to somebody, keep it sober. I don't, I'm in love with you. I can't stop thinking about you. Um, I, I can't I can't wait to be with you. I want to spend time with you. I want to have your babies. I just want to be in the bed with you. I want to cuddle with you. All of that stuff brings you under the influence. All right? It brings you under the influence. And so what you have to do is you got to talk soberly. Tell me a little bit about this. What do you like to do? You got to keep it cute, keep it sober. Because what ends up happening is you end up falling in love, which is another word. Uh, another word for that is cloud nine. Another word for that is the honeymoon phase. That's all it is. You're under the influence, right? In the Bible, you can study the Bible. The Bible tells us what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not both. Let's go there. Let's go there. So you know the difference between love and being in love, okay? And I, I, I've, I've, I've used this with... Um, People, you know, especially couples, you know, when they come to me and they say, I, he, he did this to me, he did that to me, and, you know, and I'm like, well, child, did the, the man even love you? I think he did. I said, okay, let's go look and we're going to see if the man love you. All right, I'm going to show you if somebody love you. You want to see if somebody love you, right? It's sensuality. Let me show you how somebody love you. All right. Because the Bible tells us what love is, but, it, but Hollywood told us that it's a feeling. It's an emotion. That's what Hollywood told us, and we fell for that. And you know what? Now we're addicted to that feeling and that emotion, and it feels good. Realistically speaking, it feels good. It feels good. It's a drug, and it becomes addictive. All right. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. 
and I am coming from the end well, with the English Standard Version. The English Standard Version. First Corinthians 13, 4, starting at 13, 4. Now, real quick, y'all want to have some interaction. Y'all want to interact a little bit. I want you to take that person that said, I love you. I'm in love with you. I can't stop thinking about you and all this other stuff. And as I'm reading out these pointers, I want you to ask yourself and maybe put it in a chat. Was this person this? I, I remember I, I've done this with couples, right? I, I've done this with guys and they say, my wife said this and it or my girlfriend said this and that. And I say, okay, let me, let me give you the definition of love. Love is patient. Was your ex patient or is the person in your life patient? Love is patient and kind. Are they patient and kind? The Bible tells you how to test the spirit for love, how to, how to see whether or not the person loves you. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. Are we getting somewhere? Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. See, you find it out. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Now, you can look back at that and understand that you had America's version of love with 99% of the folks that you call yourself dating. And it wasn't real love. The Bible tells us that God is love. Right. And then these are the characteristics. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Y'all be having this scripture read at your wedding and you standing there with somebody that does not love you. I remember... When I was getting married, I got married at a courthouse, but ended up not getting married at the courthouse. This is the first time. The, they said that the man that was supposed to marry us, the, the what do you call him, the judge or what have you, supposed to marry us, um, he was sick at home, but he was accepting people in his house to get married. I remember that. It was funny. Uh, we went over to his house. It was one of the most dysfunctional, hilarious weddings ever. Right? Uh, it, it was really dysfunctional, only because his family was dysfunctional. And my family was dysfunctional. My mom got over there. She see this old man and she started flirting. My mom, my mom had this real had this real baby voice like, how are you? Yeah, okay. Whenever my mom flirted, she would put a s in her voice. And we used to get so annoyed. My mom said, so is these pictures of you on the wall? Oh, so this is. My sister looked at me. I looked at my sister. I'm like, my sister. <laughs> oh, what happened? Like, mom, please. My mom, for whatever reason, liked old men. She liked older men. My ex's mom and dad were there. My ex's dad knew my mom before, you know, when, when he met me, when he found out who my mom was, he was like, oh, that's your mom. I used to work for your granddad. I had a big crush on your mom. I had a big crush on your mom. Oh, what have you? But I was scared of your granddaddy. And I was like, yeah, I hear no news about um, my family, my granddad, and what have you, how he guarded his daughters. And um. His mother knew that he, he used to have a crush on my mom. She suspected that he still had a crush. So she's sitting up there looking at him, talking about, he, why you keep looking at her. So they over there are here like, I ain't looking at that one. I'm just sitting here. I was daydreaming. So you got them over there arguing. My sister going, yeah. And my mom over there looking at them. So is this straight dysfunction? All right, straight dysfunction. But one thing I can say, that man was incredibly prophetic. Everybody, every one of my friends, I know three people, maybe four people that went over to that over that bridge and got married by that man. And that man told them something that about their marriage that they didn't know. That man, I was standing there getting ready to get married to this man. We're holding hands. We're facing each other. Right. And um, that old man looked at, looked at the man I was getting ready to marry. He said, do you love her? And he said, I do. He kept his eyes on me. He said, I do. The man said, do you love her? He was like, I do. The man said, son, do you love her? And here go my head right here. See, that man thought he loved me. 
I don't doubt that. But the thing is, American love is not real love. The, the stuff that we call in America, Western world, it's not real love. He kept back, he kept, he kept saying it until all of our heads started turning. One of my friends, um, she got married over there, and the, 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 he looked at her husband and said, "Let me tell you something. There ain't nothing on that street that your wife can't give you." Man turned out to be a traitor. Uh, I forgot what he said to some in-laws of mine, but I'm saying that to say that man was incredibly prophetic. Oh, what have you? He was incredibly prophetic, what have you. But what we consider to be love is actually not love. And it's easy. If you don't have a guarded heart, it's easy. If you don't have a guarded heart as a male and you have a slight attraction to a woman or a major attraction to a woman, it's easy. If you have a tra an attraction to a male and as a female, it's easy for them to get you quote unquote in love. It's easy for them to get you quote unquote in love. All they have to do is love bomb you. All they got to do is say all the right things. And you know what? We don't want to stop them because it does feel good. Let's talk, to, let's talk about that. It does feel good. But realistically speaking, that's not actually love because you're going to sober up. And once you sober up, you're going to get to see the person for who they are. And then you may discover five years and two children later that you don't even like that joker. Okay? All right. Number five, last one for this list. You cannot divorce your spouse for being an unbeliever, being backslidden, or being double-minded. Uh-oh. Y'all look at it be like, what do you mean? And now the Bible tells us, okay, we're going to take it to the scriptures. We're going to take it to the scriptures. Let's go there. Because we have popular culture nowadays that tells us, and you know what's crazy is they sound, it, they what they're saying sounds right. Give me a second. I think it's in First Corinthians somewhere. But okay. First Corinthians 7 15. We're gonna start at 14. I'm pretty sure. We're gonna go to the uh let me see here. We're gonna start at 12. First Corinthians 7 12. But to the rest speak it, speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believe it not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And a woman which hath a husband that believe it not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. Now they are holy. Trust me. I know I know what, what I'm saying. It can sound anti-biblical until you find out that it is actually in the Bible. It is actually in the Bible. What we've done in American culture is we've added our own twist to the Bible. We've added our own, the things that we see commonly, you know, manifesting in marriage nowadays, we've added that in to make it make sense. All right. So you cannot divorce your spouse for being an unbeliever. You can't. The Bible says you win them with your behavior. Let's go to that scripture. Okay, there we go. First Peter 3, 1. Let's go there. Let's go here. Come on, right here. First Peter 3, 1. I think it starts, stops at 2. Likewise, you wives, be, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversations coupled with fear. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning or plaiting, plaiting the hair and wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. So here in here, God is telling us, and I don't know if this is the scripture I was looking for, but you win them. I don't know if this is the scripture I was looking for. Hold on. Oh, yeah. Wives, and I'll read the NIV, wives in the same way, submit to your, submit yourselves to your own husband so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. They may be won by what? The behavior of their wives. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to be won, right? It doesn't mean that they're going to come around, realistically speaking, some people don't. But God also gives us this. He said, if the unbelieving want to depart, let them depart. 
James 4, 7, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So what that means, and you, if you've ever seen that in live action, I know I have, that means that you have to win them over with your behavior or attempt to, right? That means that you submit yourself to God and resist the devil. So when your spouse is trying to argue with you and your spouse is acting up, you submit yourself to God and you resist the devil. Well, in that, the Bible says that the devil will flee from you. And the Bible also says that you can win them with your behavior. So one of two things are going to happen because God does not arrest the will of a person. One of two things are going to happen. The person is either going to get up and leave or the person is going to be won by your behavior. God said, if the unbeliever wanted to part, let them go. That's one or two. And God is saying, don't try to hold on to them. If the unbeliever wanted to part, even if they call themselves Christians, because not every Christian is a believer. Because if they were a believer, then they would have been doing what the word of God told them to do. All right. So you cannot divorce your spouse for being an unbeliever, being backslidden or being double minded. Now, there are reasons you can divorce your spouse, but these are not them. All right. What's this, what sets the stage for divorce? I'm going to list 10 things that set the stage for divorce. Number one, lies. Lies. Being dishonest, telling lies creates uh, distrust. And it becomes really hard. Um, give me a second. It becomes really hard. Brother Andre, thank you. God bless you. It becomes really hard to remain in a marriage with somebody that you don't trust. Right. And one of the things is a lot of times we keep secrets because we're afraid of arguing. We're afraid of how the spouse is going to respond or what have you. And one thing I can admonish you to do from my own personal experience I tell, you know, I told this story plenty of times, but when I got married, um, I kept a secret from him and that had everything to do with my past. And, you know, he wanted to know about body count, which is dumb. Honestly, we were in, it was dumb, but realistically speaking, he seemed to think that was an issue. And so um, he wanted to know about body count. He told me he had slept with four different women and his whole total life, which was a total lie, total lie. Right. And so I decided, OK, we, we, we go in there. Let's just be honest. Oh, we have at that time. I was still ashamed of my past because I was not too far removed from it. So I was still ashamed of my past. And so I started. He was like, you know, give me names. And I gave him one dude's name. Then I gave him another dude's name and I gave him another dude's name. And then I got to number five. He said, whoa. Don't no man want to be with a woman that's had more partners than him. And it shut me up. And instantly in that moment, I felt shame, instant shame, instant shame, instant shame. Um, but what have you in that moment? And so I named that dude. And then he was like, that it? I was like, yeah. He said, who else? I said, that's it. He said, I don't know how to be Tiffany. I said, that's it. That's it. Not long after that, we run into an ex of mine in the mall who decided to step out and shake my hand and all that other stuff and be like, how long has it been since I've seen you, Tiffany? Two, three years? And I'm like, shut up. And obviously, this is somebody that I used to date before I met this guy. And then as soon as we walked away, who was that? He a pretty boy. I know you slept with him. I said, you, so you saying everybody that I dated, I said, most guys I dated were handsome. Okay. Um. I was a young little girl, right? And so that stuff matters big time to you. And I said, so, and I didn't sleep with all of them. He was like, yeah, but he a real pretty boy. You know, he, he's super. And I'm just looking at this dude like, you don't, your self-esteem is in the trash because you look good. That's how I used to think about him. Like your self-esteem is in the trash. Uh, but long story short, um, he said, but did you sleep with him? You can't. And I, I thought to myself, you ain't gonna be able to lie your way out of this. I was like, yeah. He said, so you did withhold. I was like, listen, or what have you. So it created a problem and it created a three year argument. Matter of fact, it created an argument that lasted the entirety of our marriage. He was de definitely insecure. And I will say, don't marry no insecure man. Man, good God, I will never do that again. But um, <laughs> he remained insecure the entirety of our marriage. Um, you know, that became a problem for the entirety of our marriage because he just kept asking me about my past and this, that, this, that, and the other. And I'm like, what does that matter? What matters is what I've done since I've been with you. It doesn't matter what I did when I was out there. It doesn't matter or what have you. But since then, I will say this. Since then, one lesson I did take from that is I'm very honest about my past now. If, if nothing else, I'm very honest about my past. I'm very honest about that. So if somebody comes, if I'm talking to a guy and he says, hey, let's talk. Well, you know, um, as a young lady, what would you say? I, I was a thought. OK, I wasn't the, the, the thought that ran around a block with this dude, that dude, that dude. But dude, no, I did date this one. 
And then while we were dating, we did play bump and grind. And then if we broke up, I did date that one. And while we were dating, I probably played bump and grind with him. And then I dated that one until one point in my life. And you can find this in my book, Devil Bait, How Heals of Spiritual Warfare. When I talk about my time and promiscuity, I said at one point in my life, I did get to a space where I said, and I met a guy and I was like, hey, I don't want a high body count. We didn't use the word body count back then, but I told this guy. And I didn't trust the guy to be a faithful man. I could tell he wasn't. But at the same time, he looked like the type of guy I wanted to, you know, have that type of engagement with and what have you. So I said, will you be my splack of belly? And he was like, what was that? And I was like, glad you asked. Between relationships or maybe even in relationships that I don't consider to be serious. Because, back, you know, when you're in the world, you have relationships that you don't plan to go anywhere. It's just entertainment. I was like, I want to be able to... Um, have my needs taken care of and you know and i know you want that too so can we just form a partnership in that he was like well i've never had anybody ask me that before but i mean spike of belly was a song back then it, it was a song back then that you know was t- encouraging women to cheat and all that saying basically she needed to have her side dude or what have you and so i was in the world listening to that song and i thought to myself and uh shamar moore who was the actor on that song, by the way. Okay. So yes, of course, you know, you, you had a lot of women out there looking for their own personal Shamar Moore, wanting to have them a, a fine man that they can go sleep with whenever they wanted to, with no strings attached. And that's what I ended up having with that guy. I ended up having a no strings attached relationship with him for a total of about two or more years. And that was my attempt to not have a high body count. And so because of that, I will say I don't promote it, but it did keep it did keep me in that retrospect. But I will say this. Um, I've learned personally, to be honest. I've learned personally, to be honest. All right, let's move on. What sets the stage for divorce? Lies. Number two, secrets. Secrets. Now, I'm not saying that your husband or your wife needs to know everything there is to know about you, but some things are important. And you need to find that out during the dating phase or what have you. If you're if somebody is courting you, or more so courting, because you don't tell your secrets to somebody you're dating, dating is about collecting data. Uh, but when you get to the uh, into the courting phase, you do want to there's some things that are important to share, right? I'll, I'll give you an example. If you engage in a same-sex relationship and your partner wants to know, that is important to share that. You know, you may say, well, Tiffany, that's totally irrelevant. Uh, That's totally this. But realistically speaking, it may be important to your spouse and you don't get to dictate what's important to another person. Right. You don't get to dictate what's important to another person. And so you want to take the time out to share that. Um, You want to take the time out to share that. So secrets, Um, even secrets that you've done. I, I watched a lot of skits and stuff like that. And I see some of the dumbest things that people do. They keep secrets and stuff. And I'm like, bro, tell her. It is not that big of a deal. It's going to become a big. It's going to become a big deal because you kept it. And I need every man on here to hear this because I've noticed that when counseling men, y'all keep some of the dumbest secrets ever. Like it's not that deep if you tell a woman in the beginning. Honestly, and, and ladies, let me know if I'm wrong. One thing, women, when we keep a secret, it is typically going to be major. Men will keep dumb secrets, like my ex called me. It's not that major in the beginning. Most of the time, if you say my ex call, we'll say, hey, why is she calling you? Uh, Yeah, I don't want her calling you or what have you. But then inwardly, we'll appreciate you for telling us because that makes you look faithful. But no, you'll keep it a secret. And then some at some point, we're going to find out. Oh, so you've been so you've been talking to her. Now you look like a villain. Now you look like a cheater. Now you look like a cheater. Y'all. Thank you. Thank you. This is probably one of the most least engaging audiences I've ever had. Y'all got to let me know y'all up in here. All right. Number three, pride. Pride destroys everything that it touches. Had lied about having kids in this age. Right. And it'd be the dumbest stuff. It'd be the stupidest stuff. Most of the stuff that a man lies about or a woman lies about, most of the stuff that a man lies about, is it, it, it would not have been a big deal. It would have been a conversation. It would not have been a big deal. But a lot of times with guys, they 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 say in their head, I don't want her to tell say this, or I don't want her to feel this way. And then they'll keep it a secret. And by the time it comes out, we find out about it, now we don't trust you. All right. But pride. Pride. Pride destroys everything that it touches. The Bible says pride goes before destruction and a haughty look before fall. 
Pride destroys everything that it touches. And so anytime you lift up in your heart, um, let's say, for example, your spouse is trying to communicate something with you and you feel like this is what pride tells you. Pride has a voice. Pride says they're trying to control you. Pride says, bro, she's trying to control you. You need to stand your ground before you, you, until you end up with your balls uh, in her purse. Or she have your balls dangling on her earrings. And then you start lifting up and you basically start resisting her just because you're trying to prove a point that is pride. Pride will have you arguing with a person without even hearing what they say. Pride will have you sitting back contending. I had a sister in Christ reach out to me and, you know, she's in her process of healing. And I used to fuss at her about her baby's father. Right. You know, uh, a lot of times she was tell me about her interactions. And I'm like, you've been a little bit rough. And I would tell her you haven't forgiven him. She's like, I did forgive him. I'm like, uh -uh. you being a little bit rough with this guy. I say, well, dude, based on this conversation you're showing me, he ain't really said nothing bad. But it was all in how she interpreted it. And that was years ago. I hadn't said nothing about it for years. Recently, she came to me and she's like, I realized that, you know, I had some stuff going on back then. And she was like, when I look at those stuff and I look at what he was saying, I understand what he was saying now. And I'm like, yeah, because you're reading it from a healed heart. You're reading it from a healed heart and what have you. But she was like, I realized that it wasn't that deep. She said, I, you know, back then, she said, I'm looking at my response. I'm like, wow, I was, a, I was abrasive. So I tell you, go ahead and make sure that you heal. But pride, pride always destroys everything that it touches. And ladies, I'm going to tell you something. I, I'm going to tell you something. Men, women deal with pride. All right. We know that. But men, men heavily deal with pride. Most men, a lot of men, not most. I won't say all men typically deal with pride. I want to do a class for women at some point to teach you how to navigate around it. Cause I've been playing with that fish for a long time. Leviathan, I, 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 one thing about it is I've learned how to operate that thing. All right. And I'm not talking about manipulation. I'm not talking about mind games. I'm talking about basically not engaging the pride and engaging the man and not just engaging the man, but engaging the part of the man that Leviathan is guarding. So for example, if he happens to be, um, he feels like you're trying to control him. Then in that moment, you show him your submission. You show him your, your meekness and your submission in that moment. Oh, Lord, your ex little name was pride. I think I would have ran from that. But pride, you show him your submission. And so this is what you're doing is you're doing a form of deliverance in that moment. You sit back and he says, I, I said I didn't want to go here. You know, uh, uh, we went to that restaurant last week. OK, let's go. Where would you like? To, where would you like to go? No, nah, because I don't want you just going, you know, I'm not going to argue with you, baby. I, no, no, no. You're the head and I submit to you. I love you. Okay, let's go where you want to go. And what it, what it does, and let me tell you what it does. It takes the person from being extremely hot. And then all of a sudden they're having to cool down and it, they're having to cool down at a fast rate. And they don't know what to do in that moment. No, I don't feel, no, no. I'll tell you what. Let's go here now and then we'll go where, where I want to go next week. Deal? Because right then and there, he's maybe feeling like if we go to my restaurant, you ain't you're going to hold this over my head. You're going to do this and you're going to do that. So now what you do is you insert compromise. If you realize that he's resisting when you offer that to him, insert compromise. Hey, let's just go here now and then we can go to my restaurant next week. Or I could go and get me something to eat from there maybe later today and I can bring it back home with me. It's not that big of a deal, babe. It's not that big of a deal. I want you to enjoy yourself. And I'm going to enjoy myself because I'm with you. You see the difference in that? Instead of getting caught up in your feelings and saying, what you see, what you don't understand. Now, because what you're going to do, because when you get into pride and he get into pride, all y'all going to do is clash. Yeah, you can disarm pride. Trust me, you can disarm it. And you, once you learn the art of it, it actually becomes fun and funny. It becomes fun and funny because you learn how to just not engage that person in that retrospect or what have you. You learn how to engage the human or what have you can separate the soul from that spirit. Um, so what you're doing in that moment is, um, I will say it's almost a form of deliverance, but in that moment, when you see that thing rising up, you don't entertain that thing. You don't entertain that thing. Instead, in that moment, you take the time out and you speak to the man and you speak to his, not just his, his humanity, but his, his position as a husband. 
you speak to his position as a husband and you speak from a, a meek place or what have you. And when you speak from a meek place, what that does is that puts you low or what have you. So even in that moment when he's still trying to be high, it's going to feel bad. And he's going to start kind of, he'll be like, babe, okay. I, he may say, I, I got a headache. I don't really want to eat. And you say, hey, no, 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 we're not doing that. Even if we go get it and we can go to the house and eat or we can go to two different restaurants or what have you. But I don't want you to feel that type of way or what have you. I want us to have a good day. I want us to have a good day, okay? So you don't have to be, you know, frustrated. And I want you to know that you can trust me um, to not be mad at you for making a decision. Because at the end of the day, we have what I wanted to eat or we can get what I want to eat or what have you. And you, you're a compromising person. So we can do that. So I don't want you to feel some type of way. I can tell you what's going to happen right there in that moment. I can tell you some science to me. He's going to get quiet. There's going to be quietness or what have you. And then let's say if he's driving that hand, going to come across that thing. He's going to grab your hand and hold your hand. I can tell you. But you want to dismantle pride. You don't dismantle pride by arguing with it, right? Because offense and pride work together. And so if I'm arguing with a prideful man, he ain't going to humble himself. Me clapping back ain't going to make him settle down. What that, what that would do is it'll cause his, that, that spirit to rise up even more, right? What's that's the stage for divorce number four? Lust. James 4, 1, let's go there. Let's go. I think I got it already up on my phone. Let me see. Yep, James 4, 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, they war in your members. Let's go read another uh, version of this. Because King James be doing us in. King James be wearing us out. Okay. King James. We're going to read English Standard Version. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this that your passions, the King James said lust, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your lust or to spend it on your passions. And we're going to stop there. That is James 4, 1 through 3. What causes quarrels and fights among you? Is it is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Every time I've seen a divorce happening, every time, even within, it's always one person or both. But there's always one person in the marriage that wants something that the other spouse say they can't have. And neither one of them are willing to stand their ground. And sometimes the one, the per, the one that wants something is completely wrong. And it's an issue between them and God, but it's a severe issue between them and their spouse as well. So you may have a spouse that wants freedom. And I'm talking about unnatural, like like he, he wants to be like a single man. Now, I don't feel like I should be at, I got to be at the house all the time. And, you know, I, I want to go hang out with my boys. I want to kick it with my boys. And the wife is saying, you should have got a, that, all that out your system. You know, you're supposed to be the protector of this house. You want to come home at two and three in the morning. And so there's no protector here. Do you know the time, the hour for the thieves? So you want to be out in the streets or what have you. Ain't nothing out in those streets. Ain't nothing up open but legs, the old folks used to say. And so that spouse, because of his pride, one thing I've noticed with pride, people will always divorce you for their pride. If you don't get rid of pride, you will always divorce your spouse. You will always choose your spouse. You will always choose your pride over your spouse. You cannot prove me wrong. You will, as long as you have pride, as long as you don't humble yourself, you will always choose your pride over your spouse. But it's always something that the other person want and they're refusing to let go of. I want my freedom. You're like, bro, you got your freedom. You can go. I'm not saying you can't. How you going to? You can't tell me I'm a grown man. I can go do whatever I want. You are married. And as a married man, you going to the bar. It's not okay with me. You going hanging out late, it's not okay with me. And it's not a negotiable thing. It's not something we can negotiate. Well, you can do whatever you want. If that's a problem with you, but I refuse to be controlled. You want to go on our separate ways? You see what right then and there, that man is choosing his self, his lifestyle, and his pride over his spouse. I wish somebody so shared this with somebody going through a divorce. In that moment, you're choosing something because you already chosen that thing over God in the first place. You already chose that thing over God in the first place. It is always some one of the spouses, in many cases, that has an unrealistic desire, unrealistic expectation that they're not willing to let go of. And the other spouse starts to fight with them about it and say, hey, this is not okay. It's making me sad. It's making me depressed. It's making me insecure. And then the other spouse is gaslighting and they're refusing to let go of that thing. And the next thing you know, the other spouse that says, hey, 
I've lost my peace. I, we've been fighting for the last three weeks, the last three months. I've lost my peace dealing with this. And to recover their peace, they say, okay, we're going to have to go on about our business. Every time, every time you will, you get it. Marriage counseling, you're going to see that 100% of the time when you, you see a couple, there's always typically one of the people that want something that the other person says, that's a non-negotiable. That's a non-negotiable. But pride or lust, number four, it's not lust. Number five, double-mindedness. Double-mindedness. When you're double-minded and unstable, you're going to have an issue between you and God. You're going to have an issue between you and your spouse. It's going to uh, bring about uh, distrust. Double-mindedness. Let's move on. Number six, rejection. I want to move on from there because I want to get straight over here. Rejection. Whenever you are rejected, when you deal with rejection, deal with it while you're single. Address it while you're single. I can tell. And can I, I, a lot of people deal with it. Realistically speaking, in the United States of America, um, during um, my generation and millennial generation, all the way up to Gen Z, all the way to throughout the generation, the last few generations, there has been a heavy spirit of rejection, a heavy spirit of rejection. And what the thing about it is, I can always tell when a man has rejection issues, right? I ain't even got to be dating him. I ain't got to be talking to him or nothing like that. I can tell when a man has rejection issues based on things that he say. Because a lot of what he says is going to come from assumption. These are going to be thoughts that he has in his mind, uh, things that he feels like is holding him back from getting what he wants. Maybe it could be with a female, right? I could see a guy, maybe he has an interest in a female or what have you. And it'd be the things that he says um, that shows that he feels like that female is rejecting him. And so he doesn't know why she's rejecting him. And so he's assuming she's rejecting him. So consequently, he starts to burp up or gr regurgitate what he thinks is the reason that she's rejecting him based on his own experience or based on um, what he feels about that type of woman or what have you. But that's rejection. Rejection will always make you feel like you're being rejected. And hear me, it doesn't go away when you get married. You, when you accept a rejected person, they're still not going to be satisfied because even in a marriage, they will typically define things that you do as rejection, right? They will typically define everything that you do. So something that's minor for a person who's not wrestling with rejection could be major for a person who wrestles with it. So let's just say you happen to be married and the dude's name is Tyrone and you and Tyrone are lying next to each other in the bed and um, you reject Tyrone. You're tired that night, right? You're tired. You got to go to work the next day. Tyrone came home a little bit later than he was supposed to. He got off at nine, but he came home at 1130. You, you talk to him about that. You say, hey, I told you. And he says, maybe I worked a little bit later. Plus, the guys want to stop and get something to drink. And what have you, you said, OK, whatever. whatever. So you turn your back. Right. And now Tyrone trying to have sex. And you tell him, Tyrone, I got to get I got to wake up at five. Leave me alone. I got to wake up at five. So now he's throwing his body all over the bed, throwing a tantrum, making it hard for you to see if you said Tyrone. Or it's not that deep. It's not that. Please let me see. But I got to go to work at five. And he pulling the cover and he's doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Oh, what have you? And in many cases, that has everything to do with him being rejected. That has everything to do with him dealing with rejection. So, whereas a man who's healthy mentally and spiritually will understand that well, this, this woman is literally telling me that she's tired. Oh, what have you? And he'll say, "So I messed up." And you're like, "Yeah, you should have came home." If you'd have came home, I would have been awake. I'm tired. I'm not trying to punish you. I'm just tired. Or what have you. So a healthy man will be like, all right, all right, okay, I, I, I learned my lesson. And then with a healthy man, many times you'll get convicted and you'll go and give in anyhow. But with an unhealthy man, he takes it. You must have slept with somebody else. You're trying to punish him. Um, you're trying to control him using your, your body parts. That's how he's going to take it. So that tantrum he's throwing on the bed has everything to do with what, how he's interpreting the things that you do. And so that's why I say you don't want to marry somebody who deals with rejection. You want to make sure that that's an issue that they have addressed. I used to deal with rejection. And I can tell you, um, when I look back at it, I, I, I can't say I was the easiest spouse either, right? When I dealt with it, I especially dealt with it when I was married the first time. Um, and I mean, he gave me reasons to feel, feel rejected, but I can honestly say, looking back, you know, hindsight 2020, looking back, I can see that some of the things that I did and some of the things that I said were not good. They came from that place of fear, fear of being rejected, that fear of, oh, you're going to walk away. You're going to do this or what have you. I'm going to say this, ladies, half of the talks that we ask a man to have come from rejection. Babe, can we talk? Babe, can we talk? 
Baby, can we talk? And a man gets really annoyed. It comes from rejection. I'm not saying all of them do. I'm saying a lot of them come from, so babe, you did this the other day and you made me feel like this. You made me feel like that. And people get tired of talking about your feelings. Right. Insecurity is a sign of rejection. Definitely. People get tired of talking about your feelings. All right. I need a favor, guys. Do me a favor. Be sure to like and share. For those of you who are just coming in, be sure to take the time out, if you will. Hit the like, hit the love button, hit the share button. Facebook, let me know you're in here. Hit me some hearts. Give me some hearts. But rejection, rejection, I would love to stay here for like an hour, but I can't. But rejection is one of those things that creates a big problem in marriage because it it ha- it, 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 it deals with the interpretation of your actions. So, for example, even in church, when we have people come into the church that deal with rejection, they interpret things wrongly. Somebody dealing with rejection in a church will, you know, for example, if they don't feel like they um, got, you don't want to be their friend or they, 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 they don't feel like they got promoted or something like that. They can interpret that to mean you, y'all don't like me. Y'all been talking about me. I know somebody said something about me and this, that, this, and the other. And that's not the case. There's always a theory going on in their mind when dealing with rejection. Rejection creates theories. It creates theory. So there's always a theory going on in their mind. Whereas, okay, my theory is you you doing this because somebody said this or because you got, you know, you feel this way about me and women like you always up with me. And so whenever you're in a house with a person that rejects you or a person that deals with rejection, all too often they're going to interpret things or misinterpret things in a bad space. So if you're dealing, you're in a house with a woman that deals with rejection to my brothers in Christ. Hey, Sister Shante, how are you? I love you, beautiful. Love you. But let's say you, ha- you happen to be in a house with a, a, a woman that deals with rejection to the brothers in Christ. Um, a lot of times she can interpret, for example, let's say she cook and you playing a video game. And you act, she says, hey, come eat. Now, that's offensive when it's, I'm going to call it what it is. It's offensive. If I cook, I expect you to get off that game and come eat. And you say, no, nah, give me a moment. Give me a moment. And you, you keep on playing that video game. She can internalize it. So when people deal with rejection, they will typically overreact to something. They will typically overreact. So something that could have been resolved or something that could be a small uh, a, a talk, a lecture or something like that can turn into her slamming stuff, going into the bedroom, crying, curling up in the fetal position and all of that stuff and, and not wanting to talk to you. And then they're starting next thing, you know, you start having talks of divorce and stuff like that because rejection is one of those things that's going to keep on moving. Rejection will always cause you to uh, feel rejected Consequently, you will start doing things to reject your spouse, causing them to feel in-house rejection. And then over the course of time, the atmosphere of that, of that house becomes very toxic. It becomes very hard to live in. It becomes very hard to live in. So one of the things that you definitely want to deal with before you even consider getting married, you want to get rid of the spirit of rejection. And you also want to get rid of the system of rejection. That's the pattern. That's the habit. So, for example, I tell people. And I've had this conversation with many people, right? And they say, well, I just feel like, you know, there, there was these women, they were standing around. I just feel like they don't love people. And I just went up there and I said hello to them and what have you. And they just said hello and they kept their back. And, they, you know, I feel like they this and they, they didn't want to let me in. And I said, well, they don't have they don't have to let you in a circle. It's not always rejection. Realistically speaking, people have a capacity. Everybody has a capacity. So they may not have a great capacity, right? That, that right there, they've reached their capacity and we're happy. And sometimes some people, they don't necessarily want to bring other people in because they've been friends for 15 years, 17 years, 25 years. And that's how they, that's how they rock it. That's how they roll. Don't take it personally. It's not personal. It's not personal, but whenever they're dealing with rejection, they will internalize it. They will internalize it. And it becomes this big event in their head and in their hearts and what have you. And sometimes it can be tormenting enough to get them to either leave the church or to actually do something um, you know, to, to become, become argumentative, wanting to fight people or what have you. I've seen that plenty of times in churches, right? Plenty of times in churches where people come in dealing with the spirit of rejection and they just interpret everything wrong. Everything for them. She didn't hug me. I had a lady tell me one time, young lady tell me, I think she think I want her husband. I'm like, who? Oh, such and such. I think she think I want a husband. I said, why you say that? Because she don't really talk to me. And I'm like, ma'am, No. You're an introvert. She's an introvert. Catch this. We're just weird. Okay. Amen. I said, we're just weird. We're not always the great. 
we're not always that great at socializing. When we don't know you, we're not that great. So if I'm married as an introvert and my husband is cool with you and he starts to speak to you, I'm probably going to be the weird one out. I'll pro I'm going to say hi or what have you, but I ain't going to say nothing else. I'll probably be just standing there. And you can't interpret that because in that, I'm just not that socially good. All right. And so God is building me up socially, but I'm not me. I hear first before I respond. So I'm, I'm studying. I'm listening to see what type of person you are. So I don't give you the wrong version of me. Right. I, I'm going to. I'm, I don't want to give you the wrong version of me, right? I may come a little bit too strong or I may come a little bit too soft. Either way, I don't want to give you the wrong version. So I'm just kind of listening. And I, I say, you just got to listen. T take the time. I said, don't don't take things personal. I said, it's not personal. That, I said, nine times out of ten, she's standing there because she doesn't want to look insecure. I said, you said she smiled at you. I said, she doesn't want to look insecure. Oh, what have you? I said, don't take that personal. Don't take that personal. But when you're dealing with rejection, rejection makes you take everything personal. Number seven, unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectations can and do destroy marriages. Unrealistic expectations. I also want to stop and say this real quick. This can be a lesson for how to build up your marriage. For those of you who are single and this is uh, for those of you who are married or getting married, how to sustain. Right. So I was thinking about that when I was coming, uh, putting the notes down, like this can go either way. But unrealistic expectations. Sometimes you can be dealing with a spouse who's not that healthy physically. And you can come in and you got all that energy and all that. Let's go. And you're too much, right? Let, I, I want to make love again. I want to do this. I want to do that. And you can be too much for your spouse. You can be too much. Or maybe you want to cook and clean. And you want to do all this. And you can be too much for your spouse. You could be a whole lot of energy. And a lot of times people, we don't always communicate. Right. And I can honestly say we don't always communicate, you know, with um, each other when we're struggling. You know, we, we don't always communicate with each other when we're struggling, because the thing about it is sometimes we're ashamed of the fact that maybe I don't feel I'm not that healthy or I, I'm not as healthy as I want to be. Sometimes we can be ashamed of that kind of stuff. But unrealistic expectations, you got to just. OK, let me say this. Cre create your expectations around a person's habits. And not around your fantasies of them. It'll keep you sane. I want y'all to hear that. I want that thing to hit your head, hit your heart. Create your expectations. This is why you study people. You create your expectations around a person's habits. And then you even got to give them grace in that. But you create your expectations around their habits and not around your desire. If you create your expectations around their, your desire, you'll become controlling. If you create your expectations, for example, if... If I'm married and I, I know my husband touched me every two nights, you know, every two nights, that's my expectation. I'm not going to get in the bed and be like, you didn't touch me a night. You know, he's like, we, we did something yesterday, baby. But we ain't do nothing tonight. My expectation is that he's going to touch me every two nights. So if I want, if I want to do something, then I'm going to touch him. If I, if I want to do something, I'm going to touch him. Because in that moment, I'm creating my expectation around your pattern, your habit. And what that does, catch this, it, it gives me love and grace. It gives me grace for you, right? I, now I have grace. So you have grace for your spouse because you're not creating this unrealistic expectation based on a fantasy, a need, a demand, a desire, or what have you. you your expectation is set to what their default is. Anything that goes beyond, be above that default is a bonus. I do that. I think about, I always talk about like when it comes down to my family or what have you. I don't have expectations for them. Like when it comes to my dad, I love my dad dearly. I don't have expectations for my dad to show up and call and start acting like, you know, the father, you know, like a father figure or what have you. I don't expect him to do that. Consequently, whenever he does decide to call, I'm not mad at him. I expect him to not call. I expect him to choose his women first. I expect him whenever he calls to apologize and to do this, I expect that because that's his pattern. I literally know his pattern. I know his pattern. He's going to call me whenever the woman's not around. He's going to say, she's Jezebel. She's this and she's that. He's going to cry and tell me how much he loved me and daddy trying to get it together. I got this job opportunity, this, that, this, that, and the other. And then he's going to go back and repeat the same pattern. I'm not mad at him about that. No, You know why I'm not mad at him about that? Because that's not, that's not something personal. 
that's between him and God. That ain't between him and me. I just so happen to be his daughter. So I get a whiff of that. And so whenever he calls, I'm like, you're fine. You're fine. You're, you're good. Daddy did it. You're, you're good. I'm not taking that personal because that's his pattern. That's his pattern. Now I, I look at my um I look at my sister. I remember she used to get really mad about that stuff and she would get a, and I would tell her, don't if you keep on doing it, you run yourself crazy. That's his pattern. That's his pattern. So whatever he does, say, hey, baby, dad, it'd be a year, a year and a half later. Daddy this and daddy that. I'd be like, hey, dad, how you doing? You know, daddy love you, don't you? I love you too. Ain't no all in my heart. I ain't angry. I ain't mad. I ain't frustrated because I made peace with how he is. That ain't who he is. That's how he is. I've made peace with that. I made peace with that. And I learned to live with my brothers and sisters in peace. Meaning, I don't take things personal because it's rarely ever personal. You got to hear that. That's what makes you a blessing when people can be around you and be imperfect. Okay. When they can be around you and you're not reading into everything or having unrealistic expectations, you give people the grace to exist. Give people grace to be. Give people grace to be. All right. Number eight, comfort. Comfort destroys marriages. Comfort, inability to grow and to evolve. Comfort can destroy marriage. You get so monotone and things keep happening the same old way that eventually it gets boring. Eventually it gets boring because there are emotions that are not being tapped into. There are um, opportunities that are not being tapped into. And so in a marriage, you have to switch it up. You have to switch it up. And I'm not saying that you got to switch it up every day, all day. I'm saying... That sometimes you got to do something that you least expect. You, you have to break away. You got to sit back and say, okay, I love you, baby. But I'm tired of the little one hip move you do when we in the bedroom. When you put that one leg and you straighten it out like it's something like you got a Charlie horse or what have you. And yeah, that, that, that move ain't doing it no more. <laughs> that ain't doing it no more. I, I don't know where you got that from. Or what have you. And I, I let you ride with it for probably about a year or three years or what have you. But now, it's a little, it'd be a little raggedy, okay? It'd be a little raggedy. I love you, but I'm gonna need you to find something else to do. We're gonna have to do something else. Maybe we gotta get out this bedroom. Maybe we gotta go and, and we maybe we need to go get a room or something. Maybe we gotta go somewhere. Maybe we gotta spice it up something. But that little move that you're doing, it ain't working. All right. And sometimes I'm just being honest. Sometimes you just gotta say, hey, we've gotten too comfortable with each other. Or what have you, as humans, and I don't want my best times to be when I'm away from you. Does that make sense? I don't want my best times to be whenever I'm, I'm, I'm hanging out with my friends or whenever I go places. I don't want those to be my fun times. Don't get me wrong. I want to have fun times with them as well. But I don't want that to be the highlight because when I come home, I know what I'm going to get from you. Because I know you're going to put that one leg and you're going to straighten that one leg out and you're going to be up in there and what have you. And then I can time you. It's 11.50 and he'll be done by 12.02. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. And you hear a squeal one. Yep. Blast off. <clears throat> Blast off. You you have to be able to say, okay, we've gotten a little bit too comfortable. We got a little bit too monotone. We got to do something that makes us engage one another. And sometimes what you have to do is you got to get to a space or get to a place where you're not comfortable. It's fun, it's strange. But you maybe need a tour guide. You need somebody to show you around because what that does is typically when we're in a space where we don't feel safe or we don't feel in control, it makes us draw nigh or close to the people that we feel safe with. Does that make sense? It makes us it makes us draw nigh or close to the people. So let's say if we up in Dubai somewhere. I don't know what to do because I'm a female, right? I don't know, you know, I don't want to get bashed across the head. I know you don't have to wear a covering over your head or what have you, but we don't know where we're going. We know there are some bad areas over here. Maybe we in New Orleans. I heard about New Orleans. I still haven't been there. But I heard, you know, watching TikToks, you some places in there, New Orleans you don't go. So what that does is if I'm with him in a strange place, what that's going to do is it's going to make me grow. It, it, one, it's going to keep me it's going to keep me, my adrenaline up. Adrenaline creates memories. It's going to keep my adrenaline up. 
And it's going to make me grow up, grab a hold of him. And it's going to make me notice every moment because you typically record moments whenever you're in that space. And so in it, I'm just sitting there like, baby, did you just, just see that woman? You see that woman? See, because I trust him. I don't know it to a guy. So sometimes you got to engage. You got to get to a space where you can't rely on yourself and you can't rely on your spouse. You got to go to a space someplace strange or what have you so that you can rekindle. You can rekindle. All right. Com comfort. All right. Sometimes you got to move the furniture around. Sometimes you got to move the furniture around. Sometimes you got to paint the walls. Sometimes you just got to get up and say, hey, listen, um, I think we need to go, you know, to South Africa. And one thing I plan to do, God willing, I plan, I, I really do. I want to buy property in, in, in different countries. And I would love like to be able to fly to South Africa for two, like two months it's with me and my spouse. You know, just be able to get up randomly and say, hey, I don't want to be in America right now. They're acting crazy over there. He said, stop farting. <laughs> but they're acting crazy over there. Or I'm, I'm feeling some type of way. I just want to get out and see something different. I want to have a different experience. I just want to have something different going on. Right? But comfort. Number nine, external voices. You can't have everybody speaking into your relationship. You can't have everybody knowing about your relationship. External voices. You want to make sure that anybody that you talk to is approved by God. And just like in the natural, you know, you have therapists with licenses and then you have uh, life coaches. Now, life coaches are great. Life coaches are amazing. I'm a life coach myself. Um, I'm a life coach that retired herself and may get back into life coaching in the future. But I do life coaching. I do ministry. I think that's uh, one of the ministry and life coaching. I wanted the same. But there are some things that you will only tell a therapist that you wouldn't tell a life coach. There are some things, something high key or what have you that you wouldn't to tell a life coach. And you got to be careful that you're not sharing certain things, you know, like with, with mama, cousin. Uh, there are certain things you got to be careful with what you say, because a lot of times what happens. And I've said this to uh, plenty of women. I say what you'll do is you'll say something and shame yourself. You'll be like, I'm tired of him. He raggedy. He be putting that one leg up in the bedroom. And then at the same time, he be choking. And he got that one bead of sweat falling. And then he fart all the time. And you will say all that stuff. And then you'll be like, I'm leaving him. I'm tired. I ain't going back to him. And then y'all are reconciled. And then you shame once you reconcile. So then you're trying to keep it a secret. Uh, you, you're sitting up there and you're just like, well, and somebody said, hey, how's everything? Oh, we talk. We talk. And you don't know what that person is going to do with that, right? You don't know how they're going to respond because sometimes people can get mad because they're dealing with their own. They got unprocessed pain. And because they have unprocessed pain, they were looking for you to get back at Tyrone using your man. These men, girl, because Tyrone got out. Tyrone left them. He left them high and dry. But now, now they found you in a situation. They feel like it was the same situation. Sometimes you become a person's what is the word I'm looking for? What is the word I'm looking for? Sometimes you become a person's way to get back at another person, if that makes sense. Mm -mm. See, girl, what you should do? Uh uh. Because I'm going to tell you what I. Uh uh. You said he'd be putting that one leg like he got a Charlie Oars. What you should do, because he ain't got no stability at that time, push him off of you. Push him off. Make him hit the floor. <clears throat> Right, man. Push him out, make him hit the floor. And then when he hit the floor, girl, what you do, you step over him, right? And you go get in the car and you leave his dusty self. And that has nothing to do with your issue because your issue may be a minor issue, something you're just communicating. But to them, it takes them back to what the last dude did to them. And so now they, they sit up there, they become the cheerleader. So what's going on now? Because they're so invested because of what happened to them. All right. Number 10, last one, adultery and idolatry, which are one, one of the same. And if, if, whenever you get into adultery, you get into idolatry, right? It's, it's always idolatry before it becomes adultery. But that sets the stage for divorce. It's whenever you're not content. It comes from being non-content. And it always comes from being not content with God. And whenever you're not content with God, that has everything to do with an area of your life and an area of your soul that is wounded that you have not invited God into. It has everything to do with a void. And from within that void, there's nine times out of 10 demons and imaginations that have to be cast down. All right. So 
let me give you some steps or what have you then we got to get loose and i gotta do these kind of quick because i got a few of them steps to avoid divorcing number one keep god first god blesses everything when he's the head because when he's the head he gets to control it you become a body your spouse becomes a part of that body god blesses it when he's the head but if you make god an arm you make god a navel if you make god a toe if you make god an ankle then god can't bless your relationship god can't bless your relationship so always keep god first that means regardless of what i want matter of fact that will keep down 50 percent of your arguments at minimum um because then you you start saying this is what i want but let me take it to the world let me see what god wants let me pray about it keep god for, first number two pray together daily that strengthens marriages pray together daily you know sit back and say hey babe it's time to pray um if you in your own room let's say to the brothers in christ she in her own room and she praying or what have you sometimes it's good for y'all to come together in prayer right you come together at the table. You come together um, in the bedroom, but you want to take the time out to pray. So pray together. You want to pray together daily. Now you want to pray daily. Realistically speaking, your wife may go to bed before you, and she's going to pray before she go to bed, and you may go to bed. And that's, ter- that's perfectly fine, as long as y'all are praying. But you take the time out because we pray throughout the day. Take the time out to pray together. It shows intentionality. Take the time out. Like he walking out the door. Hey, stop real quick. Let me pray for you. Stop real quick. Number three, study the word together daily. Study the word together daily. That helps to strengthen you. It also helps to keep you on one accord because when it comes to scriptures, we don't always get the same understanding or what have you. He may have one understanding. You have one understanding and create a division or what have you. And I won't say that you're going to be able to study the Bible together every day because sometimes you may like your own study time. Maybe he wants his own study time, but I will say try to study together as often as you can. Number four, Healthy communication is key. I can sit here for a long time, but I'm not going to do that. My passion is healthy communication. If you want to ask me anything, if I feel like God called me anything in this world, if I feel like God put anything in me, it's healthy communication. I believe in healthy communication. I believe healthy, healthy communication saves everything. It saves it saves your marriage. It saves your job. It saves your, your relationships, your friendships. It saves everything. I believe healthy communication is key. Healthy communication is key. Because all too often what we do is we're, we're, we're just trying to avoid, I don't want to offend, I don't want to do this, and I don't want to do that. And you, you got to understand the truth doesn't always offend people. Healthy communication is key. You talk to somebody, you sit back and say, hey, listen, um, babe. Going back to the leg. <laughs> babe, what's that raggedy move you did in the bedroom? Don't do that. It make every time you do that, you look like a praying mantis to me, and it does something to me. And I just it takes me to a day. I don't know where you get that from. You look like a praying mantis and some type of like shedding, like you're about to shed your dead skin or something like that. Make it fun, but healthy communication is key. Talk to your spouse. Hey, I didn't like that. Okay, or I, you know, when you said that, that 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 hurt my feelings. So could you please, you know, try to say something softer? We ain't got to go to let me say this don't build a case don't don't collect stuff this is what we have a problem with doing especially the those of of us as ladies i know i've done that in the past where we'll we'll keep things in our heart we'll keep it and we'll let that stuff stack up and then by the time you know then we start getting mad and we start getting frustrated and then we'll start saying like you did this and then you did that he like dang you unleashing on me you did this and then last thursday you did that and then may 88 2046 you did this and he like May 88 don't exist. Yes, it do. You did. Then you did this in my dream. And you did that. Don't let stuff collect. That is like dust collecting, right? I sweep my floor quite often. I won't say I do it every day. I used to do it in my old apartment every day. I got to get back to sweeping every day. But when I'm not sweeping often, guess what? If I don't sweep too often, if I don't sweep every other day, when I sweep up, it's going to be dusty because I got a dog that we be going out that door. Okay, we go in and out that door. Oh, we're having and so I have to make sure I'm sweeping because it's going to collect. And that's what you got to you have to understand, understand. Issues are like dirt piles or it's like little grains. And if you collect them at some point, when you come, you're going to bury your spouse with all that dirt. You're going to come in. You did this and this and you're, you're going to had a heart shift or a heart change. Whereas you could have communicated that. And I, I don't know if I have this in the notes. So the best thing to do. Um, is to, and I, do, I think I do, but the best thing to do is communicate a solution. Don't communicate the problem, communicate the solution. 
a lot of times we're like, I don't want to seem like I'm arguing all the time. I don't want to seem like I got a problem all the time because I told him about a problem yesterday. I told him about a problem here. No, be a solutionist. Go to him and say, hey, babe, I got a solution. A solution for what? That leg. I got a solution. Pull it down. Let it rest on the bed. Okay? And if you got back problems, I'm going to take you to, we go to the chiropractor. I got you. I even pay. We're going to go to the chiropractor so they can do something with your back. Okay? That's what we're going to do. But come with a solution. Where were we? Oh. Healthy communication is key. That one leg must be upset. <laughs> Listen, that's the example to keep popping up in my head. Maybe I need to cast it down. But healthy communication is key. Half of the stuff that we argue about is unnecessary. Half of the stuff that we argue with our spouses, our parents, our siblings, completely unnecessary. It's just have, having a healthy conversation. Healthy conversations come from a place of security, whereas you can sit back and say, let me say this. If you are a part, if I'm a part of your life or you're a part, if, if you're a part of my life or something like that, you are secure to communicate with me. Even if I do something you don't like or something that made you question, you are secure. You And you have to give people that grace to be secure to say, hey, I'm not going to blow up. I'm not going to yell. I'm going to seek to understand. And then I'll explain. Did you see that? It's that simple. It's just, oh, okay. So I can interpret. Let's say if I was married, hubby comes through the door. He doesn't speak. Had, had that happen one time. I was silly back in that day. And I interpreted it. Okay. I love you too. But I interpreted it as somebody must have ticked him off. I don't know what conversation he'd had. I don't know what's going on with him. But he ain't going to come up in here and treat me bad just because he had a bad day at work. That was stupid. That was stupid. So what I had to do, I had to get to a space where I had to realize that, Tiffany, you're in error. That man could have had a bad day. Why, tr why not try communicating with him? Why not try saying, hey, how was your, how was your day? You didn't come in. You didn't give me no kiss. You just came straight to the door. Seems like your energy is off. Are you good? Yeah, I just had a hard day. Okay. Okay. Is there anything you need from me? Instead of, you can go right back out that door and find whoever it is that ticked you off. You ain't going to come in here and take it out on me. You're not going to come up in here and take this out on me. I don't know who to take you off, but you need to go call them. You see how unhealthy that is? Y'all, are we here? Y'all still here? Y'all y'all still breathing? Y'all still alive? Y'all still... The eclipse didn't get you, did it? Y'all didn't get raptured again. You know, we been raptured like 89 times, including to conspiracy theorists. Y'all got raptured over there? We good? Okay, just making sure we still alive. Okay, let's move on. Healthy communication. I can say that all day, but we're going to move on. Number five, master the art of forgiveness. Master the art of forgiveness. That's something you want to do when you're single. Learn how to forgive people. And that's something you pray for. You ask God for. You want to go to like a school of forgiveness. You want to get to a space where you're saying, okay, how do I forgive? Or what have you? How do I, how do I sit back and forgive 70 times, 70 times seven? How do I, how do I forgive? Hear me. Let's say I gotta, let's say you gotta forgive to the brothers. You gotta forgive your wife. Because you told her, mm, not to spend any more money, and she spent it anyhow. And it's been a problem, a repeated problem in your marriage. You've been communicating that for a long time, but she keeps spending money. Sometimes what you have to understand is that, one, you got to forgive her. Forgive her. Don't put on a punch because it could be a stronghold. It could be retail therapy, which means that she needs actual therapy. Oh, what have you? Because that's what we do. Realistically speaking, women as women, we love to shop. I got, um, I got, I recently discovered Timu, and I do not recommend anybody go to Timu, okay? I, I recently discovered that I ordered 20, 20, 30 some pair of shoes and got them the other day and didn't know how to act. I went back and I told myself and I told my students, I ain't going back over there. I got darn that $700 of worth of stuff in my shopping cart over there. And if I go back over there, it's going to probably be 2000 if I add. I just love it. I'm not going to pull the trigger. I just did it because I'm telling myself no. All right. But let's say I had a husband. He said, Tiffany, stop spending. 
You got enough shoes up in there. You got enough shoes to supply a small country. He wouldn't be lying. Um, don't buy no more stuff or what have you. But let's say I got an issue, okay? And I can't stop. I can't stop. Timu is addictive. You know, that's what everybody, uh, everybody, some of the students that's going on vacation with me, it, that, right, that's what, it's the devil. Sharon, that's what they were saying even in my church. They were like, it's, it's a stronghold on there. You get on there and you literally be like, add to cart, 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 add to cart. And you ain't going to stop. You ain't going to stop because every time you look up, you're going to see something cheap. And you'll be like, oh, that's, oh, that's cheap. Add to cart, add to cart. And you get your first order in, you're like, it ain't as raggedy as people said it is. Add the car, add the car, add the car. What would you say that my husband should do? Should he scream at me? Because your team was my views, Hawaii. I have over $4,000 worth of beginning. My Lord, 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 Lord. <laughs> but should he yell at me? Should he cuss me out? What should he do? If he comes and he looks and I, if I go to Timu right now and I hit that buy button, because it's already set the apple. All I got to do is click, click, click. Hit that double click and it's, 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 it's a wrap. What should he do? They always have coupon. Let me find a coupon. I bet. Let me find a coupon. I've been just waiting on them to send me a text message saying, did you get 50 cent off, 50% off or what have you? Let me find a coupon. Sheen for me too. Sheen and, and Timo. Both of them. I had an order come in with both of them the other day. My order from Timo. I don't know how they got all that stuff in that bag. It was like 20, 20 25 pair of shoes and some nails. I was like, because I saw one of the girls at my church had some nails. And I'm like, why am I paying all this money to get my nails done? And hey, I got to sit there for hours. Come on, I'm telling you. They're coming on the cruise. Addictions. What should he do? Should he yell at me, cuss at me, and be mad at me and shift the atmosphere in the home? No. What he should do. It said, we're going to have to sit down and we're going to have to develop something where you have a little bit of money that you have access to, but you can't have access to the discount. Come up with a solution. Because yelling at a stronghold ain't going to stop you from being a stronghold. Yelling at a stronghold is not going to stop you from being a stronghold. Realistically speaking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull the trigger. That stuff in my car, the, tr the, tr the trigger is going to get pulled. It's like it. Put some coupons on that joke. I just don't. I, I just got. I got seventy five. How many things I got in the cart? I don't need this stuff. And I, I got to stay off of this side. I'm gonna have to delete this app. Seventy nine. Like take away the card. Give me access to another card. You know, take. He said, Let, let's take that money out that account. We're gonna put it over here, so you can constantly keep getting denied. That's how you deal with a stronghold. Because at some point, he got to realize it's not me disrespecting or disobeying. It's an issue. At some point, it's an issue, right? In other cases, he just need to leave me alone. Just let me be, okay? Let me be, because I'm going to talk to no one. You going to tell me I can't spend. I was single for 10 years. I can spend all I, all I wanted when I was in. So now I'm, now I'm married. And uh, what I, I, I gained a man and lost my ability to buy? What is wrong with you? Go get a 44 job if you need to, because I want to buy. I want to get my stuff, okay? I want to get my stuff. That's me talking to us, okay? Anywho, number six, understand each other's wiring. Paparazzi jewelry, I could not sell that. I would be, I would buy it all up. I would buy, I, I could not sell that. Understand each other's wiring. Understand that he may be an introvert, you may be an extrovert. He may be an apostle, you may be an evangelist. All of this has everything to do with wiring. Um, so if somebody is apostolic, they typically are forward thinking. Right. They don't think about an apostolic person can seem to be relatively insensitive uh, because they are they're futuristic in their mind. They, they don't want to stand there and sit there and argue with you all day long. A prophet, on the other hand, wants to sit there and talk about it and cry about it. And then they want to make love and then they want to sit there and talk about it a little bit more and all that other stuff. Prophets like to sit and stuff. Prophets like to sit and stuff. Prophets and prophetic people like to sit in the stuff. Uh, an apostolic person wants to hey, I'm sorry. What's the solution? Let's move on. Let's move on. I don't want to fight about it anymore. I Okay, well, I didn't know you felt that way. I'm so sorry. And whenever you're dealing with an apostolic person, they can seem narcissistic because they're not emotional. 
an, an episodic person may seem narcissistic because they're not emotional, realistically speaking, because they're not going to sit there and tarry. Whereas you feel like, yeah, I'm just tired. I'm just, you know, and you, you're going through all these emotions. And, and he's like, are you going to cook? So you can think about cooking. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm just saying, baby, this, you, you got PMS. Okay. You got, you got PMS and I understand I told you you couldn't hit the buy now button on t on, on, on Timu. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't hit the buy now button on Timu. And so yeah. But you don't, I feel like you don't care about me. I feel like this. I feel like that. An apostolic person is forward in their thinking. They can be relatively cold. And it doesn't mean they don't love you. It doesn't mean they don't care about how you feel. It's just emotions are typically pointless to apostolic people. Emotions are typically pointless to apostolic people. All that emotionalism is typically pointless. If you get a prophet, on the other hand, a prophet wants to sit there in it. A prophet will typically get caught up in fantasy. They want to sit there and talk about it from layer to layer to layer. And from yesterday to last year and to three years ago and to back when you were in your mother's womb, they want to go into all the depths of all that. And then they want to seal the deal by kissing and making love. And it can almost seem like a prophet is starting to fight just because they want to go through those layers. And some of them do. Some of them do. But uh, the funniest marriages that I've ever had to the, the, uh, the, the pleasure of counseling. And I always counsel. I, I do one week or two weeks of counseling and I send them to some people I know that have been married for like 30 or 40 years. But the funny part is when I see an apostle and a prophet married. It's the funniest marriages in the world. Funniest marriages in the world. It's because both of them are sitting up there. The the uh, the prophet is ah, I'm just tired. He just don't care. He's so cold, and he like I ain't cold. I just I just want to move forward. I just want to move forward. And I'm just like, eh, that that's the case. Or the hardest marriages are when two apostles are married, two apostolic people, dry. <laughs> dry because both of them don't have that many emotions right both of them are not that emotional they're not that romantic they're not that okay realistically speaking you get two apostles in the house they're not that romantic and they're gonna try they're gonna put forth the effort or what have you and one may put forth more effort than the other it's gonna always feel like somebody don't care so when you start understanding the wiring i remember i was counseling this couple when i lived in congress and i was like do you know your husband's wiring and i said do you know your wife's wiring and they didn't know I said, do you know he an introvert or an extrovert? That ma that matters. I said, that matters because if I'm, I'm an introvert, if my husband come through that door talking about some baby, he got a group of dudes with him. Trust me when I tell you he'll see it on my face. Trust me because he just violated one of my, my one of my commandments. Thou shall not bring your friends home unless you have told me so I could have prepared weeks in advance for this. That's why I tell you. I, I was talking on TikTok today. I said, that's why I won't, I won't five to ten acres of land whenever i start buying a house and i want like i won't I, at first i said i wanted one guest house i changed my mind i'm like i want like five of them i want to have like guest house number five like two acres away when you got company take them jokers out there because you messed up mess around and marry be married to an extrovert and he want to have people over tiny house number five i, I don't know why i started liking tiny houses Tiny house number five, two acres away, walkie talking me when y'all done. 10 4, she gone. He's gone. 10 4. You're making your way back to the house. 10 4. That's it. That's introvert talk. <laughs> That's introvert talk. But I'm saying we all have different wiring. And sometimes we assume people are being rude because they don't think like us, because they don't reason like us. It makes sense to us. Does that make sense? It makes sense to me. It makes sense to me. I just want my peace. I want to be able to walk around my house and not have to put on no clothes. Maybe just put on a gown or what have you. I, I don't. I, I don't want people in the house right now. I don't want all of those di different energies, for lack of a better word, in the house. I don't want all that right now. I just want to be by myself. Amen, Sister Shante. Right. I need peace and quiet. I, I need to be in the house by myself. I don't want that. And if you coming through the house with a basketball, talking about some, come on in, y'all. When I tell you that's World War Four for me, that is that's a nightmare. I'm like, you couldn't have communicated that with me. And for him, he may not see that's a big deal. He's like, babe, you keep making a big deal out of nothing. When people have those type of conversations, it's because they don't understand each other. Above all that, get and get understanding. 
you're an extroverted introvert. That means you're an ambivert. Right? And introverts suffer more. And that's why I say, you know, whenever you understand that before you get married, you can put some stuff in place, right? Before you get married, you can say, you're an extrovert, I'm an introvert. Yeah, we need a guest house. We need a fully finished basement and we need a guest house. I'm sorry. I'll say, I do. we, we got to have, they got tiny houses out now. I think you do one as low as $10,000. We need a guest house, bro. We, we need somewhere for you to go and to get all that effort and energy out so you don't, and we're going to pimp out the guest house. So I want a big screen TV up in there. I want a nice, uh, big old round sectional couch. I want you to have a stove. I want you to have everything up in there so you ain't ever got to come back in the house whenever you have company. You ain't got to come in the house whenever you have company. You can go straight, baby. I'm out of the house. Okay, cool. You have your own space to go out there, okay? You have your own space. All right, let's move on because I don't want to keep you guys up too late. Number seven, lose so the marriage can win. Lose so the marriage can win. You say, Tiffany, what are you talking about? Sometimes you win the argument and lose the marriage. Sometimes you just got to lose so the marriage can win. Sometimes it's just, it, you got to choose your battles wisely. You have to choose your battles wisely, carefully. You got to choose your bat battles wisely. Sometimes you got to sit back and say, it ain't worth the fight. It ain't worth the fight. He didn't put the toilet seat down. It ain't worth the fight. He got boo-boo streaks in the toilet. It ain't worth the fight. Like I said, sometimes the best thing to do is make a joke out of it. Sometimes the best thing to do is just make a joke out of it. It's just to basically say, here, um, <clears throat> me and my little silly tail will probably take, because I buy those, uh, uh, I don't buy this, the scrubber that you use in the toilet anymore. Ever since I found the one, uh, I think they Clorox, where you stick the thing on there and then you clean that way. I love those because then you can just, you can throw it away. You just keep the stick and you can stick another thing on there or what have you. He would literally wake up if he did that to one of them laying beside his face. Just, no, no worries, I wouldn't be using it because I'm not going to put something nasty. I'm going to be I'm talking about a clean one. It would be laying beside his face on um, with a, a letter to say, use me. Use me. I exist. I would have rose petals from the bed to the bathroom. Or I have it on the toilet, have some rose petals from the bed to the bathroom, a note on the toilet that says, take brush, put it in here clean it. He'd be like, so you did all that. I'm thinking I'm going to come in the bathroom and I'm gonna see something like something freaky and stuff. I come up in there as a toilet brush and a note on the toilet. That That's my creativity. Creativity can be insanity. But I'm saying that to say, <laughs> I'm saying that to say, you know, take the time out. Don't make a fight out of everything. So you got to lose so the marriage can win. You got to lose so the marriage can win. My creativity will kick in. I'll do something dumb. I'll do something funny. Or what have you. Lose so the marriage can win. Number eight, stay connected to wise counsel. The Bible says there's safety in a multitude of counselors. That's not just for individuals. That's corporately. That's for the unit. That's for the marriage as well. Stay connected to wise counsel. And hear me. You need wise counsel. You need people to tell you the truth, right? You need somebody to tell you the truth, regardless uh, of how you make it feel. I, I remember when I was married and there was this lady I used to work with at Walmart. And um, I had told, and this is, I was young. I was in my 20s. I told my close friend, you know, I was mad at the man I was married to. And I told her about it and she was siding with me. And then I told this other lady I was working with. And um, I remember the lady, I didn't know her that well. She worked in my department. I was still kind of new in that department. She's a little bit older than me. And I told her and she told me, she said, you were wrong. She said, you were wrong. I should have tried. I'm telling you. I'm, t I'm trying to tell you. Have fun in there. I do some creative stuff. I, rather than argue, I'm just going to sit up there and be and spend some money. I will put rose petals. Rose petals. Rose petals straight to the toilet. Rose petals. A romantic day. And then after that, he don't wash his tail. It'll be rose petals going straight to the bathtub. bathtub. I've been ran the bath water and everything. He'd be like, romantic night. No, you need to wash your tail. You need to wash your tail. Read this letter. Dear hubby, you stink. You smell like your onions and a wide open booty right in front of a fan. And you got the audacity to come in the room trying to do something with me. Don't nobody want to spell you. You've been stinking for the last few days. I know you didn't got comfortable. I know we've been married for a long time. And just because we've been married for a long time, you got to look familiar. So you think it's okay to stink in front of somebody. No. The Bible told me to respect you. In order for me to respect you, I need you to wash your tail. 
I need you to go up in there and I need you to go up into the corners. I need you to go up in there. Like literally, I need you to stop being afraid of feeling gay just because you're having to put your hand. Go in them crevices. Okay. Go in them crevices. Cause I'm sorry. <laughs> Listen, because on that last stroke, I smelled you. I smelled you bad. I'm like, that dookie. <laughs> This man, nobody ever taught him. Nobody ever put some blooms on the back of a chair and taught him how to wipe his tail. Nobody, nobody. But stay connected to Wise Council. Stay right. Stay connected to Wise Council. All right. Number nine. Remain faithful to God. Your faithfulness. Your faithfulness to God is what's going to sustain your marriage. Your relationship with God is what's going to sustain your marriage. Stay, and that's not just for you. Both parties. Stay faithful to God. God has to be number one. And one thing I think you have to adjust to it throughout a marriage is that you have to constantly keep on putting God first. Because when you're married, you automatically will put the spouse first, right? And so what you have to do is you got to constantly go before God and say, hey, God, you first. I will have you. And you got to go before God as a unit and as an individual. God, you first. You first. But remain faithful to God. Number 10, master the dance of evolution. Master the dance of evolution. You say, what do you mean by that? We are a constantly evolving creature. We are constantly changing. Really, at the, at the end of the day, how I am now may not be how I am in five years. In five years, I prayerfully will be wiser. In five years, I'll prayerfully have um, more wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And what that will do is it may cause me to tap into another dimension of who I am. And so I may not, in five years, maybe I'm not joking. Or maybe I'm joking all the more or what have you. It is to say, I'm not who I am. I'm becoming that. But I'm going through a process of evolving into who God designed me to be. And that's a process. And so one thing about it, when you're married, you're always having to reintroduce yourself to your spouse because you are becoming something. You're becoming somebody else. And that typically is preceded by depression. Whenever you start going off into another dimension of yourself, Sometimes you can start feeling depression because you're grieving the old you. You're grieving the part of you um, because you feel the change and you feel like I can't do this stuff anymore. Stuff I've been doing, I can't do it anymore. And I can't explain it, but I'm not interested in the stuff I used to do. And so consequently, stuff starts being undone and you may think that you're going through depression. But realistically speaking, you're just evolving. And as you're evolving, you got to get introduced to yourself. And then you go and introduce yourself to your spouse all over again and say, hey, babe. I was into this. I was into that. But now I feel like this is what I'm called to. This is what I feel like I want to do. And you got to and you got to be, be married to people who know how to have relationships where you're constantly evolving because they're going to have to reintroduce themselves to you as well. And sometimes people don't think because they don't think to reintroduce themselves because they don't realize that they evolved. And sometimes you got to just look at your spouse and say, nice to meet you. You talking about nice to meet me. You're changing and it's good. You're growing. You're growing. And I, I, I like it. I like it. You know, it's nothing wrong with you growing. Yeah, I, I appreciate the growth. But master the art of evolution. Number 11, individual therapy can be better than marriage counseling. Individual therapy, because sometimes it's not a marriage problem. Sometimes it's an individual problem. Sometimes one or both parties is half past crazy. And so sometimes what has to happen is, because I've, I've had plenty of times, I remember when I used to do marriage counseling, um, where I tried to avoid it, God kept throwing couples at me. Uh, back, especially when I was living in uh, Congress. And um, I know I noticed that a lot of couples look for marriage counseling. But then when you talk to them, you realize one spouse, is have, one spouse has issues, right? And they're sitting up there, but you don't know what my mama did to me. That's the reason I do that to her. And you don't understand what I, and I'm like, eh, sis, he don't need marriage counseling. He need individual counseling. He need individual counseling, individual counseling. And if you get marriage counseling on top of craziness, it's not going to fix the issue. Because it becomes behavioral modification. Now we're trying to teach him how to modify his behavior without changing his heart. When he go to individual counseling, that's going to be a heart a heart therapy, right? It's going to deal with the heart. It's going to deal with the individual issues. What happened between you and your mama? What happens between you and your dad? What happened here? What happened there? And that's something he should have did or something both of y'all should have did before you got married. Um, or what have you. And throughout the marriage, because we need constant therapy. But sometimes it's not a marriage counseling thing that you need. That's why marriage counseling didn't work. Oh, that's why marriage counseling is not working. It's not working because the problem isn't y'all, it's him, or it's you, or it's her. It's not a y'all thing. It, it's that person. 
most of the times in marriage, when you see the marriage start doing like this, it's an individual in the marriage that's starting to buckle at the knees. It's an individual issue. It's that individual that needs to go put their head on somebody's couch. All right. They need to go put their head on somebody's couch. So you don't want to always think that is a couple's issue. You want to say, OK, this is her or this is him. And he's been acting out. He's been depressed. He's been sad. He's been agitated. We don't need marriage counseling to fix that. We need uh, individual counseling to, to, so that he can go ahead and address that issue. All right. Or maybe we can pass oral counseling. Number 12, date each other often. We talked about that, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. It can become monotone. It can become boring when you're not dating each other, when you're not dating each other. Um, it keeps it keeps things alive whenever you get up and you go do things together. Um, for example, even going to a park, putting a blanket on the, on the ground and, and grabbing some snacks and just sitting there and gaining a few pounds while looking at the lake and the ducks and what have you. That can be fun. But you want to take the time out to date one another often. And sometimes it can be scheduled dates, other times spontaneous dates. Where were we? Number 13, intimacy over sex. Intimacy over sex. There is a difference between intimacy and sex. If you ever, and I need the brothers to hear me on this. Ladies, did y'all even share? Look, I think some of the people that went to sleep, did y'all even share? I need the brothers to hear this. If you keep having sex with your wife, your wife gonna stop wanting to have sex with you. There's a difference between intimacy and sex. Intimacy has everything to do with the head and the heart. Sex has everything to do with the body. Y'all don't be sleepy on me. Do, do I need to do part two tomorrow? Intimacy, sex has everything to do with I am aroused and I want to get my rocks off. And that can make a woman feel used. That can make a woman feel used and make her feel like all you want to do is do this. If she's sad here, upset here, depressed here, frustrated here, anxious here, it can almost feel like R-A-P-E. I remember telling that I was married and I told him, I said, I literally feel like I'm just giving in, you know, just so that we, I feel like I'm just doing my wifely duties. I'm just giving in. I said, I feel like if a man kidnapped a woman and she just went ahead and complied just so he wouldn't take her out. That's what I feel like. I said, I feel like I'm being R-A-P-E. And he was like, I can never touch you again. He touched me later that day. But I'm saying, I mean, I, mean, I communicated it to him. And I said, you know. With a woman, because we are the weaker vessel and because we are relatively prophetic, with a woman, we need intimacy. Intimacy is what tosses us into a whirlwind because we need to we need to feel safe. We need to feel love. We need to feel all of those things because throughout the day, with all the work that a woman does, cooking, cleaning, and taking care of the kids, all of the stuff that we do, we do as women, Sometimes we can feel like slaves. We can feel like maids. We can feel like we're just doing this, doing this, doing this. And when you come to the bedroom on top of that and you're like taking off your clothes. Yeah. It's like another job I got to do. You see the difference. But if you come up in there and you stop and you say, hey, listen. Before you get to the bedroom. I'm wash those dishes. You're already starting to make love to your wife. I wish I wish every man here. You're already starting to make love to her. Give me that broom. Put that broom down. Relax. You go into that room. It ain't all about you. You just say, I want to make sure you're okay. How are you doing? Intimacy. Intimacy. Talking to her. Hearing her heart. Saying, I, I'm, you know, I love you and I want you to know that you are seen. You are appreciated. She go right then and there. That's intimacy. And then, catch this, when you get into the bed with her, don't clap her like you a chihuahua. All that fast stuff and flip over here, flip over there, pull your leg up here. All that. That ain't that ain't going to be fun. Sometimes you just got to take your time with her. Sometimes you got to take your time and just spend time just telling her how you feel, making love to her. That's intimacy. Guarantee she's going to think about that for the next three days. I'm telling you, y'all better snapshot that. I'm, I'm telling you. She going she gonna to want to touch you for the next three days. If you ever get to I'm, I'm talking to my brothers in Christ. If you ever get to that space where all it becomes is clapping, bend over here, this, that, this, that, and the other, and it's just job, 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 you're going to have Old Testament te sex with your wife. you have Old Testament sex with her because she going to sit up there. He said, do part two tomorrow. She going to sit up there 
And she's going to be like, I don't feel like doing it. Because she already know you coming in. Like you said, you coming in hot. No, you coming in selfish. You coming in selfish. And then you're going to be squealing and stuff like that. And she's just like, I ain't getting nothing out of this. Women tend to get more out of intimacy than anything. Women tend to get more out of intimacy than anything. So intimacy over sex. Now, I'm not saying that you don't have sex because in marriage, there's going to be sex and intimacy. Sex is going to be typically you getting ready to go to work and you got 45 minutes left or what have you. Your job happened to be 22 minutes away and you you woke up, maybe you're having a sunny day and you want to do something. And then you do, you know, that that sex, right? It has nothing to do with intimacy or what have you. You have that in marriage. You're going to have plenty of those encounters, but you also want to have intimacy, right? You want to have intimacy. Uh, understand that a wife is going to prefer intimacy over sex. Number 14, be solution-minded and not problem-centered. Be solution-minded and not problem-centered. Don't always talk about the problem. Don't always complain. Don't always be a Martha. Sometimes you got to be a Mary and sit at the feet of Jesus. Be solution-minded and not problem-centered. In other words, come with a solution. Sometimes you need to think it out and say, what is a good solution for the problem that I'm having? And then go communicate it. Remember, you're going to go back to healthy communication. Then go communicate it. What is a good solution? Oh, yeah. I'm going to tell him to put that leg down. Let me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show him. I'm going to say, let me, let me show you, baby. See how, I put, see, see how I put my leg down? Let me start playing with that. But be, be solution minded. You cause problems and you cause people to become defensive when you're a problem center. You want to be solution minded. So always come with a solution. It's a lot easier to say, hey, I got a solution for this problem. He said, I didn't know we had a problem. Yeah, that was bothering me. I want to make a suggestion. We do this. And most of the time they'll say, okay. And right then and there, an uh, argument that could have took two days, three days, three weeks, three years could be knocked out in, in, in five to 10 minutes, maybe 15. All right. Number 15. Pray for and with one another. And I got that in the number two, pray together daily. So we'll move on from there. 15 was pray for. So you might as well say, stop with that. Make sure you intercede, right? Make sure you intercede. So pray for one another. Pray for one another. So intercede. Number 16, get regular bouts of deliverance. Get regular bouts of deliverance. You want to make sure that that's a consistent thing in your life. Um, I always say, learn how to cast demons out of each other. Uh, because it, 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 if my husband come walking through that door and he all all aggravated and stuff like that, I ain't going to try to solve it by having sex with him. He going down, he going down. He going to be cool little shit, be messy. Come up and out in the name of Jesus. Come up and out in the name of Jesus. I cast a demon out that leg. Come out of his leg. <laughs> Get regular bouts of deliverance. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. I ain't going to let that leg go. I'm sorry. Y'all have started me. I ain't gonna let that leg go. Get regular bouts of deliverance. Make sure you're consistent with the deliverance. All right. Number 17, be spontaneous. Don't always be predictable. Don't be monotone. We talked about that. Be spontaneous. Do things that the other person did not expect you to do. Learn new things, but be spontaneous. Number 18, get busy in your assignment. Most frustrating person is a person that's bored. Most frustrating person is a person that's bored. Get busy in your assignment. What is God calling you to do? Right. So God told you to write some books, go write some books. God told you to develop um, a business, go develop a business, whatever it is that God told you to do, go get busy in that. If you don't do that, what you're going to do is you're going to be frustrated all the time because you're going to always want a ton of quality time. You're going to want a ton of conversations. You want a ton of everything. And then you're going to be arguing all the time because you're not busy. So you want to make sure that you get busy in your assignment. Number 19, I'm trying to move a little bit faster because I don't want to do a part two. All right. Number 19. Listen to learn, not to respond. Listen to learn, not to respond. You don't always want to have a, 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 a stiff neck or, or an answer or what have you. Remember, you got to choose to lose in some cases. But listen to learn, not to respond. Sometimes you just got to sit there and be quiet and say, okay. Okay. Sometimes you need to look like this. What you doing? I'm writing down notes so I can remember what you said. I'm, I'm putting it in my jar because I want to make I want to remember what you said, what you're talking about. So listen, and learn. And then I can also, con, you know, I can contend. And when I say contend, I'm not talking about arguing. I can say, hey, bullet point number three, you said this. And I told you, you know, I, that's something that we can negotiate on a lot of things. But number three, I don't think that's that's a no go for me because I feel like 
what that does is it makes me feel insecure. It makes me feel like that. So that's a no go for me. And I don't understand why you want to, why you insist on doing that. Oh, we haven't known how I feel about that. So that's something we can further talk about. Hopefully we can come up with some type of solution. Um, or what have you, we can push that past. Um, and that, that, that it's not something that you hold fast to, to the point where it can become detrimental uh, to us. So that's healthy conversation. Be, get busy in your assignment. Listen to, listen to learn not to respond. Number 20, create a marriage constitution and honor it. You know how many couples I've said that? I tell people this all the time. A constitution, a marriage constitution is something that you create, whereas you have laws, right? You have a discussion about something that's problematic and you have a law and that law you say, OK, this is something that I can't do, something we can't do or what have you. This is the constitution of our marriage. Right. And it's something that can be amended over time as you evolve, as you grow. But you have it in the laws. These are your, your little bylaws. And so what ends up happening is, let's say that the spouse uh, violates that law, right? You can come back and say, here, you see, on March 13, 2022, this was a part of our bylaws because this was an issue. I learned this from having a business and always having to create rules every time I came across a problematic customer. Customer comes along and the customer doesn't want to follow, about, follow the rules or the customer wants to be uh, relatively contentious. And I had to learn to just create laws and rules and what have you and sit back and say, hey, listen, these are the uh, frequently asked questions. These are the rules. These are the guidelines. These are the penalties, uh, what have you. And I had to learn to keep adding to them as we went, uh, what have you. So that became almost a constitution. I learned the importance of having that. So a lot of times when I've come across couples who are in trouble, I tell them to create a personal constitution. And it, it can be relatively effective if the, cu the couple is willing to do the work. Create a constitution. You want to have a constitution where you, you detail issues, you communicate stuff, and then this becomes a law. This is something we're not going to do. Or what have you. And if we want to revisit this in the future, we can. If we want to revisit this in the future, we can. But right now, this is something I feel is problematic or what have you. Number 21, stay on top of your physical and mental health. Nobody wants to smell you and nobody wants to smell your attitude. Stay on top of your physical and mental health. Get therapy and take a bath. Clean up. All right. Don't come out of there smelling like fish chips. Stay on top of your physical and your mental health. Number 23 is God first and then y'all. Proper protocol keeps the devil at bay. Is God first. Thank you, beautiful. Is God first and then y'all. Proper protocol keeps the devil at bay. All right. And I think I already had that one in my notes. Something about God first. Number 24. I see I'm kind of doing some repetition vacation often. Didn't realize I was doing reputation, but it is what it is. Vacation often. Number 25, supplement your needs with kingdom relationships. <laughs> Listen, I'm telling you, they be coming out feeling like fish chips and onions. Supplement your needs with kingdom relationships. And you say, oh, are you telling me to cheat? No. If you're a woman and let's say your husband is uh, not a talker. He's not that great emotionally. Let's say he's an apostle, right? He's not that... Sometimes it's good to have a friend that you can have that you can talk with. You can go on a deeper level with. So sometimes you got to realize some people just don't have the, some of the things that you're looking for, and, you know, that you're looking for in a partner. Some people just don't have the patience that you need. Maybe they got patience, but not the patience that you need. Uh, sometimes some people don't have the depth of understanding that you need. Right. Some people don't have everything that you need. So sometimes you supplement that. Um, you can get that, for example, from a good friend. And I'm talking about if you're a woman, a female friend, not a male friend, right? Not, not a male friend. I'm talking about from a female friend. If you're a male, not from a female friend, you get it from a male friend, um, what have you. But you want to supplement your needs with kingdom relationships. You want to make sure that these are kingdom-minded people. Number six, number 26, and it's 30 of them, so we're almost done. Number 26, laugh, don't be uptight. Put some comedies on. <laughs> Put some comedies on. I am a laughing person. I don't know why God created me like this, but I am a laughing person. I laugh a lot in my house. I laugh, laugh, laugh. I served in my church all Sunday. We laughed. I was talking crazy. We had our meeting. We were laughing. All of that. We, I laugh. I don't, for me, a lot, of, even in stressful moments, a lot of times I try to, you know, find a humor in it. I try to find a humor in it. Realistically speaking, I always think to myself some things I can't control. And because I can't control them, ain't nothing I can do about it. Oh, what have you? So the best thing to do is just to laugh and to learn, right? So 26, laugh, don't be uptight. Laugh, don't be uptight. And I always say, Lord, don't give me one of those men 
that you know those men that are real uptight who they they when they walk their booty be so gripped together because they're so uptight because good god that man would be like Tiffany <laughs> you could you could not give me a man like that god please don't take oh lord i know you could if you wanted to please don't please don't please don't because if he uptight i am a joke i am i'm a prankster i'm just telling you i'm a prankster if he uptight if he Tiffany every time i look up he read the newspaper I'm not lying when I tell you I would put a banana by his booty. I'm not lying when I tell you you wake up with a you wake up and you put a condom on a banana and be like, what are you doing? And I'm like, you're so uptight. I'm just I'm trying to loosen you up a little bit, bro. You know, I'm trying to loosen you up a little bit because I don't know what the world happened to you in your childhood. Why everything is so serious and you so stressed out. I just feel like you need you need something. Something gotta happen. Something gotta happen. But laugh, don't be uptight. Number 27, learn to love and learn to like or love. Now you gotta love it all, but learn to like or love some of what your spouse loves. Learn to like or love some of what your spouse loves. And not everything. I would have you. I personally I don't like seafood. You couldn't drag me to eat seafood. I done had everybody in the world try to give me to eat seafood. It didn't it work. I went to a uh, I remember my ex-boyfriend back when I was in the world took me to a firefighter's banquet. And I sat next to the mayor. And uh, me being young, I was so honored or what have you. And the mayor sat up there. And, um, they, they had this big old crawfish thing. And I remember the guy, he was like, uh, they met, mentioned that I, he, I think the man, a boyfriend I had, he mentioned that I didn't eat crawfish. And the mayor, he sat there, he got the crawfish. He said, you don't eat this? And he broke it off. And he was like, come on, try it for me. I was like, mm-mm, 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 mm-mm. I done heard guys say, come on for me. Come on for me. Come on for me. No. No. I am not a seafood period person. So if you, I'm going to say something that y'all, that's going to make y'all look at me weird. I am not lying when I say this. I have never eaten crabs in my life. I've never eaten crawfish in my life. I've never eaten lobster in my life. I refuse. And some people say, how do you know you won't like it? I smell it. I smell it. And it dis- it disgusts me. And over the course of my life, I just sat back there. I didn't cook some of that stuff. I, I've never cooked the lobster or what have you. But I've seen. I'm not eating it. I'm not eating it. It ain't. It, I, I I can come. I can go to a seafood place. I'm gonna find chicken on that menu, or I may eat fish. I don't mind eating fish. You know, some fish or what have you. But I am not a seafood person. Even though they say for my blood type I should be eating seafood, I am not a seafood person. Anything that looks at me or looks like it did when it died, I don't want it. And I know that's psychological. <laughs> that know that's psychological. But learn to like and love what your spouse loves. Learn to like some things. Like if you like football, watch a few games. When just try to understand it. Or what have you. Don't mean you got to become a football fan. But sometimes you know your spouse may want a friend. And that's not just to the women. That's to the men as well. Learn to do some of the things your wife does. Your wife likes to shop. Go with her. Sometimes you know, woman want her man to be shopping with her. Sometimes we want to communicate and talk about things that we're buying. Right. Whatever. So learn to do some of the things that you like, you know, or just get in there sometimes. All right, twenty-eight. Keep the environment peaceful. Keep the environment peaceful. That means don't have no blast and TV, children screaming and hollering, it's dirty up in the house, unpleasant aromas. You want to keep it peaceful. Sometimes the best thing to do is to make sure the house has. A, there is nothing like coming to a house where there's peace. Nothing like coming to a house where there's peace, where you can just kind of relax. There's nothing worse than coming to a house where it's, cha- it's chaotic. It's clothes all over the floor. The roaches are twerking on the wall. It's just a mess up in there. It's stinking. The kids are screaming. The TV is too loud. Somebody's listening to music. You hear kids playing video games. Tell some stuff. It's too much going on in that house. It's just too much going on in that house. You just got to, sometimes you, people want to come into nothing but this. You that? You hear that? Right there, the roaches of the sea. You hear that? Peace. Sometimes you just put the dishes in the dishwasher. Take the clothes up off the floor. Throw them in a the hamper. Even the clean ones. If they're on the floor, hit that. Throw them in, throw them in the hamper. <laughs> and get and just have peace. Turn the TV down. Tell the kids, I'm going to knock you clean out if you don't sit down. You could, 
I, I, I kind of want to stop and say this. And I, I know we got to get it back on the road. We got two more, and then we're going to go. A lot of you, mixed families are a thing these days. It's not uncommon to see, you know, mixed families. And one of the things I've seen commonly, like a woman has children. Like she may have two children, three children with, you know, her ex or a, a few exes or what have you. And she has no control over the kids. And I'm talking about mainly young kids. And then she'll get a boyfriend or a husband, or let's say she get a husband and she bring him in there and she don't want him to discipline the children. And it, at the same time, she's allowed her children to disrespect him and he can't commute, you know, he can't say anything. So she expects him to come to her and to say, Hey, Junior hit me. I'm going to say this. And I know this is not for everybody on here, but I want you to hit me. Cause I know there's somebody on here that needs to hear this. Ain't nobody going to stick with you like that. Ain't nobody going to be in your, ain't nobody going to sit there and be a hat by your children. Not a grown man ain't going to come to you and say, Junior hit me. Because that's you in your kid's house. And you only invited him in there to pay the bills and to do you. That's it. And so you ain't going to find too many men unless they just completely Ahab and lost their balls in a, in a cat fight. Uh, you're not going to find too many men that are, that's going to sit in the environment where, with kids that are disrespecting them that they cannot correct. You're not going to find too many men like that. You got to have to have some type of trust where you can say, okay, yes, I trust you. And don't marry him if you don't trust him with your kids. Don't marry him if you don't trust him to discipline your kids. Oh, what have you? And you got to get those kids in order. You got to get those kids in order to the point where they ain't jumping off the, 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 the rack and breaking stuff and all of that stuff. Nobody wants to go through all of that. Nobody wants to be sitting up in the house. What was that? I think they just knocked over your, uh, your shelf. My shelf? You know, your gun rack. They got access to the guns. They're on safety. Don't worry about it. I just, uh, I, I've seen this happen plenty of times, and I'm, I'm speaking to Gen Z. I'm speaking to some millennials. Some of y'all get so tired of raising your kids that you just let them run loose. You just let them. The kid be up in there with a gun. Pew, pew. It's on safety. I, girl. <clears throat> girl, it's on safety. Kids going to be kids. Kids going to be kids. And you be sitting up there freaking out like, if you don't get up in there. And get that gun for them kids and, and, and at least pistol whip them with it. Get the, get get them to understand that they can't do that. Put the fear of God in them kids. Kids running around the house. They up in there beating each other up and playing with firearms. And you up in here talking about something. It's on safety. They don't know how to pull it off safety. Because you just don't feel like being a mama or a daddy. Keep the environment peaceful. All right, number 29. Respect one another's differences until you learn to appreciate them. Respect one another's differences. We're going to be different. None of us are the same. None of us are exactly the same. God shows us the uniqueness of his fingerprints by creating so many different individual people. And even as Christians, we're not going to always agree. The, the, you get married, you're not going to agree with everything your spouse say or whatever everything your spouse believes. And you got to learn to respect those differences because it's what makes us unique. It's what makes us our own unique fingerprint. And sometimes we want people to kind of conform to our own fingerprint, thus relinquishing their own identity to fit into the identity that fits us best. And that's not that's unfair. So you got to give people the space to be who they are. So respect one another's differences. Uh, what have you let if he sit back and say, hey, for me, a nightmare would be a man. And I, I've talked about this a thousand times coming to me and say, let's buy a small house, baby, a tiny house, because I want to be comfortable. I want to be close to you at all times. I don't want to have a big house where you can escape me into another room. He'd be like, well, will you marry me? I'd be like, nay. Of course, I had to compromise with that joker. You, you, you're talking about being close. I understand that. I understand that you're a prophet because only a prophet would say some foolishness like that. I understand that you're a prophet, but I don't want to be close all the time. Okay. I'm going to have my days. I'm going to have my moments where I literally want you to go to the basement or go outside or go away. I will ask you, do you have somebody you're going to play basketball with? <laughs> you got somebody going to play basketball with? Can you go away? Because you're getting on my nerves. I don't like your energy today. I don't like this. I don't like that. Can you go away? 
No, we got to have that small house. You put me in that small house and you'll sit up there and see the most frustrated woman. I don't understand why she's so frustrated. I've tried everything, counseling with her. And it, it will take somebody to look at you and be like, sir, you put that child, you, you, there's too much squishiness in that little space. That, 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 they're a different organism. This particular organism needs space. I need space. I, I need, I need, I, there are times I'm going to want to sit up under my husband, watch TV, watch a movie, cuddle. I have plenty of times like that, but there are other times I'll be like, you got somewhere to go. You got somewhere to go. Maybe because I like, I just like my space. I've been single for 10 years, so I like my space. But respect each other's differences until you learn to appreciate them. You will eventually learn to appreciate each other's differences if you respect them. Last uh, last one, going right back to practicalities. Thank you for sticking it out. Number 30, fast often. Fast often. Um, whenever you are married, there are times when the both of you need to strip down your flesh so that your spirit can rise up. Sometimes you have to take the time out to say, things are not changing. There is a stronghold. Uh, we can't seem to get past this issue. We can't seem to get past this. Uh, whatever it is that's rising up in the marriage, we can't seem to get past it. So you have to agree to come on. You have to agree to go on a fast together um, so that you can start to overcome things. So you want to make sure that fasting is a part of your individual lifestyle, but you want to also make sure that fasting is a part of your marriage. You want to make sure that fasting is a part of your marriage. I work with kids and families in Nutrient as parents are listening to the four and five year olds. Right. And that's some weird stuff to me. Sitting up there talking about some. What would you like, little Johnny? <laughs> That's not nice. You don't hit daddy. <laughs> All you will see, Johnny, do the, and this, the next thing you'll see is this right here. And you'll hear Johnny hit him. You'll hear Johnny screaming for his life, okay? That's all you're going to see. Darkness. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I know y'all expect me to come out here and say that I'm a part of that movement where you say gentle parenting. Nay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Johnny hit me. Okay. I don't know if I can say that. Little Johnny hit me. Johnny going to get knocked clean out. Johnny ain't going to never hit another adult in his life. Johnny going to know by the time Johnny get up, I'm like, it, those are your baby teeth. You're going to get some more back in. Okay. You can raise your kids and let them knock you clean out, but they ain't going to do it with me. I bet I ain't going to be ducking and dodging. I ain't going to be ducking and dodging. I ain't, uh, there's no such thing for that. Thing. I think half of y'all sleep. Y'all sleep. I ain't see, I've been seeing a lot of movement in the chat. I haven't seen a lot of movement in the chat. Jack, Johnny gonna act right. I'm trying to tell you. All right, fast off, and that's the last one. Make sure you fast. Sometimes, whenever you find a wall in your marriage that you can't seem to get past, the best way to get past it is to fast. The best way to get past it is to fast. That's when you have to have a corporate fast. When you get can't get past an issue individually, sometimes you want to do an individual fast. But if you notice that your marriage gets stuck, Sometimes the better thing to do in that is this is what God wants to bring you together. This brings you closer together as well. Uh, but sometimes God wants you to fast. And you say, Sister Tiffany, how long should we fast? Fast until it breaks. We keep talking about a Daniel fast. A Daniel fast, that was for Daniel. There's nothing wrong with a Daniel fast. There's nothing wrong with an Esther fast. There's nothing wrong with another of those fasts. But what about a Tiffany fast? Tiffany has to fast sometimes until it breaks. So that means I don't know when it's going to break. So it could break in three days. Then again, it may take two weeks. Then again, the Lord may try to take me 40 days and 40 nights. And God, but you, the best thing to do is to fast until it breaks, fast until that wall falls, right? And so don't, don't always think that it has to be a Daniel fast. Don't always think that it has to be a dry fast. Sometimes you have to have a fast that God caters just for you. And sometimes you got to ask Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what fast would you have me to go on? What should I do on this fast? What should I consecrate from? What should I refrain from? Or what should we do this? You got to pray together and then you have to go on that fast, right? You got to fast until that thing breaks. So in a, in a marriage, you are going to come in contact with walls. Realistically speaking, um, every time you get ready to cross over into another season, sometimes you're going to come across a wall and you can't be harder or more prideful than that wall. And so what has to happen is in order to get past that wall, the both of you have to fast. And, you know, once you fast, you go into that fast. Once you break through, you get past it. Right. There's nothing wrong with a social media fast. You want to just make sure you're, you're praying. You know, Lord, what type of fast would you like me to do? What is the fast that you have for me? What is the fast that you have for me in this 
man that I'm married to or the me for the guys is me and the woman that I'm married to. What is the fast that you would have us go on? God may tell you, I want you to go on a 52 day fast and I, all I want you to eat on that fast is vegetables and they need to be raw. <laughs> he may tell you that. Or then again, he may not tell you how long. May, he may just tell you raw vegetables and water. And you say, how, how long God? And he don't say nothing. And then you just got to keep fasting until that thing break. Until that thing break. And then God will let you know when it come off the fast. All right. I love y'all. I hope this was a blessing to you guys. I may keep it. I'm going to keep it up. I'm probably going to keep it up on YouTube with the same name that it has. And then I'm going to probably go to uh, Facebook and change the name to something about relationship because this is still something good for relationships. My dog knows when I'm giving a benediction. I pray that this bless you. Be sure to like and share whenever you get a chance. We up and we don't play. We I'm trying to tell you. Uh, be sure to like, share, uh, or what have you. And thank you for staying up with me tonight. I hope you have an amazing day. Love you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.